Hey everybody, Jeff Freeman here with the Curse of Oak Island and Beyond live stream. And to this afternoon, we are gonna have a great time. Tom Burns is co-hosting with me and we have uh, Dr. Ian Spooner and Steve Guptel. And I tell you, it's gonna be great. We were already laughing, talking as we were getting ready for the show. This is gonna be a fun and informative couple of hours and we're gonna get started right now. This is Robert Clotworthy, the narrator of The Curse of Oak Island, and I have a question for you. Could it be that you are listening to The Curse of Oak Island and Beyond live stream? This is a top pocket find, mate, for sure. All right, everybody, please welcome Dr. Ian Spooner and Mr. Steve Guptill. Welcome, and thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. This one is one of those shows that has been, uh, again, like we had Laird on last Saturday and Laird was awesome. It was a fun couple of hours and that he shared some stories with us and some insights and some things that we just didn't really know before. And we got a lot of great reviews on that show because people said, wow, look, I mean, Laird was so talkative and he was so informative and, you know, it was great. And he was great. Like on the show, he's kind of kind of quiet as well, at least as we see, I, you guys probably see a different side of Laird, but uh, it's really great to have you guys on because now we get to, you know, drill you a little bit and find out we won't, we won't do that. Mm -hmm. And as Tom and I always say, if we end up talking about a, or going down the road of a subject that we're not supposed to because, you know, you're not coming on yet, just let us know. It's no problem. We don't want to put you in a weird spot with that. So i tell you. Just, just uh, say next question and away we go. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> So Steve's been on the show before. We've had him on, and it's been fun. Uh, you were on with Laird and all that. Um, Ian, this is your uh, this is your first time with us, but and I yep. got to say, this is awesome to have you here. Well, um, yeah, thanks for having me. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and I, Steve, and Steve. <laughs> oh yeah, well, you know the other guy too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's that? What's that hat you got on there, Steve? That's well, uh, Boston. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, um, you know, let's get started with uh, with Ian. And, and I, I wanted to say, too, uh, that folks, uh, um, uh, Steve has a uh, limited amount of time he can spend with us today, and he'll let us know when he has to run. Uh, he's got some personal business to take care of. Uh, so he'll let us know when he has to go. So we'll, we'll get back and forth, and we'll find out uh, or get some questions for him along the way as well. Um, but Ian Spooner, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, uh, you, you have, you're a professor, right? I mean, you That's right. teach and everything. So tell us a little bit about your background, if you don't mind. So, um, yeah, I'm an environmental geoscientist, um, an environmental scientist really. And, uh, been at Acadia since 1994 
in one of the little known facts, actually, it's a funny, funny fact, is I knew Steve many years ago. Yeah. Uh, it, but we didn't really know each other. We actually played how many hockey together for how many years? Oh, really? Five years. Five years. Yeah. But Steve spent most of that time in the penalty box. <laughs> it's probably a good reason. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I, I um, you know, I've been here for quite some time. Um, I've been head of the department. I run a thing called the Irving Center, which is big, uh, which is a research center up the hill. And most of my work is in wetlands and lakes. And I look at the record of environmental change. Mm -hmm. And so that's um, that's how I got involved with uh, with the folks on the island. Uh, was they were looking for somebody to look in the swamp, uh, you know, look at the swamp, and uh, got in touch with me. And you know, it's where the whole story for me started. Yeah, that's how I was gonna. Uh, that was gonna be my next question. Let you let us right into that. So. Um, so somebody breached out to you and said, "Hey, were did they warn you about the swamp and the when you dig and what this what it smells like? I mean, were you prepared?" Well, you know, I've been in them about before. that. I was I've been in them before, but I think the interesting story was that, you know, I talked to folks beforehand a few times, and uh, I was somewhat familiar um, with the island because one of my very best friends is, besides Steve, is uh, <laughs> is, uh, is 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 David McGinnis. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yep. um, David and I have known each other since I basically arrived in Nova Scotia in 1994. And his, uh, the island is in his family. Uh, oh, his yeah. great, great, great grandfather was Donald McGinnis. Mm -hmm. And so I heard all these stories about Oak Island, so on and so forth. Um, but I was, you know, I wasn't really invested in the, in the, in the treasure story. So, right. When I was asked to help out, it was, uh, you know, it was just really, really busy. And then finally, it was my sister, who's a big fan of the TV show, who was who was on the island. Yeah, I met her. Yeah, Karen. Uh, she said, look, you, you know, you should you should do that. I hadn't seen the show, didn't know much about it. And uh, you should do that. And so I trusted her. And uh, and then uh, they reached out and I said, I'll give you five days. I think that's what I said to Rick. Five days. And <laughs> he still he still uh, he still holds he still laughs at that. I mean, it's been a little bit more than five days. <laughs> five yeah. days at a time. Yeah. 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 Cause it's been busy in my lab. So for me, it's been a wonderful uh, kind of run because I've learned so much. Actually, academically, I've learned a ton and met a ton of good people. And yeah. yeah. And you yeah. brought some amazing technology down there too. So yeah. Yeah, especially the rebar. I really like the rebar technology. That's really good. Yeah, the rebar technology. Uh, yeah, when you were going around in the uh, and and uh, oh. I think Tony Sampson was <laughs> pushing you around in the. <laughs> how how did you figure out that that was the place you wanted to do that with the yes, rebar? Yeah. Was that just dumb luck, or was that or was, was that there... the Stone Road? Yeah, I think you did a lot of the island. The, uh, yeah, the island swamp before that. Yeah, people were making fun of me, saying that uh, I'd have my own TV shows. Uh, Spooner uh, probes the world. I was probing everything. And, uh, and, but, you know, with, with probing in the swamp, cause you have all this technology, the sonar and, you know, Tony and I worked together on some stuff. You and I worked. Yeah. Tony. Actually that story, that, uh, swamp road or the stone road, we call it and the swamp started with a, you just wanted a probe. And I don't really know if you remember, it was the early year. Just give me a probe. And let <laughs> yeah, me walk I just around. want a probe. Just nothing else. Just let and me So probe. that's how we <laughs> found it. And he just walked around <laughs> off land and in the swamp. Yeah. And you guys thought it was crazy. Didn't you? No, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. I, just I know you did. I sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, see the truth. But, but when you hear <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Oh, that and that blew me away. Yeah. Because when we we were doing the probing, we had some indication that that some something interesting was going on in the swamp in that corner. And truth be told, Rick. I mean, it all comes back to Rick. You know, so much comes back to Rick and Marty and and Craig. But Rick had told me really, really, really focus on this part of the swamp because back couple of years ago mm -hmm. he had been in there in waders up to his chest in mud and he felt some things under his feet mm -hmm. so he said really be careful in there and so when i started to go and do the work in there and uh you kind of probing down you know three four or five meters and then you know it's kind of ding 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 and it's holy cow there's mm -hmm. something here and then it's not only just something that's like you know, maybe five feet by five feet, or it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I was, um, I still kind of get like the hair on my neck standing up because I've been in a lot of wetlands, a lot of swamps, uh, all over pretty well North America. Mm -hmm. 
and nothing like that had ever happened to me. There's not too many of them with a stone road running through them. <laughs> no, absolutely <laughs> no, not. Yeah. No. It was completely blew us all away at the time. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, I had that. I, I was using, was I using rebar? I was using also a stainless steel it thing. Like rebar. Well, not, but I not, on TV, it looked like a big piece of rebar. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I still, we still have that out there. It's still actually an important thing because it's so difficult to use modern technology like sub bottom profilers, sonars mm -hmm. in the swamp because of its chemistry. It just, it doesn't react well with all the technologies. Mm -hmm. So the good old manual, just probing. And then I was probing and you were pinning. I was tagging. Every time he had a hit, we'd tag. And lo and behold, before we even uncovered it, we knew we had something based on just how it was probed. Yeah, and you'd take the data back in the evening. And I would draft it. Draft it. We'd start seeing this thing appearing. And uh, that's the key, I mean, with the team is everybody has these skills. And all together, we can really rapidly start putting pieces together. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. On my own, if, it, you know, if this was just a random wetland it would never have come together because you, you don't have somebody like Steve to take you that in that direction. And then the others, when you comes time to, to um, actually do the engineering to uncover it. So yeah, I'm gonna, go ahead, Tom. So Steve, now when they're, when they're doing all this probing or digging or whatever, you must be running pretty much straight out all day long. Yeah. I have okay. a, uh, get at a jail free card really on the island. You'll notice in a lot of scenes, I'll be like, see you later, guys. I got to go. But I sort of do. So everything's set up for my day where, you know, I'll walk Gary and Jack into a, into an anomaly and they'll dig up. They'll spend a couple hours or maybe half a day or the morning or the afternoon searching in that area. I'll take off or run back to the money pit. If these guys are in the swamp, I'll go down and I'll check on them. So basically, if there's three or four things going on in the island, I do check ins and check outs all day long. And I sort of have a free card to do that. Where, you know, in the morning, Gary gets his schedule and it's like, Gary, you're going to metal detect lock 15. And it comes from Rick. Everything comes from Rick. Yeah. Uh, Ian, you're going to go to the swamp today. Uh, Terry and Charles are going to go to the money pit. And then I'm just sort of, Steve, just go. And then so <laughs> I have a little buggy, like a little side by side. Nice. Uh, actually, it's a big side by side. It's the size of a car. And uh, I load it up with about a half a million dollars worth of equipment that I run around the island. And um, I run around and I just keep just an active database going of everything that's so, going so on. So besides your, your GPS stick or staff, as we call it, yeah. what other type of technology would you use? I have a robotic total station, so when we get in tree cover, um, I my GPS, I don't think that's ever aired. It might this year. I'm going to use a little bit more of this. Um, I used it some last year. Mm -hmm. I don't think it ever aired. Let me rephrase that. So, okay. uh, But I do have a robotic, robotic total station that I use. The picture that Laird put up of me last year, it's got a different prism. Mm -hmm. um, that's my Jeep. That's, that's my robot. So to the normal eye, you might not notice it instead of a yellow top. It's got a clear top, ah, okay? Okay. but Perfect. to the normal eye, you'd never notice it because you wouldn't yeah. be looking for it. That said, um, I have a gyro that goes down hole of every borehole and that's about a half a million dollars. Yeah. So yeah. that's wow. about 10 feet long. So every single borehole that's finished when we're done drilling a hole, I drop a tool down. I don't drop it down. I lower it down <laughs> and it records the 3D dip or the 3D declination of that hole because no hole goes straight. So right, for right. instance, when you see sonic drilling in the money pit, it starts here, but the average drift is about two and a half feet away. So the bottom hole will be about two and a half feet uh, yeah. from the surface location. And that's yeah. important because if we hit wood um, or yep. an open cavity like you've seen this year where we thought maybe we were into an original flood tunnel, that becomes important because it gives us the exact X, Y, Z at depth of where that is, because yep. Yep. some holes run, believe it or not, about 10 feet. So mm -hmm. it can really wow. throw out the orientation if you're basing it just on the mm -hmm. surface location. And, and that explains what we see on the diagrams and that we see on TV, where you see the holes kind of worming across the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just to fill you guys in, so you'll see, so that's, you're looking at the 2D. We also have a 3D that I built that aired on drilling down a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I keep both up to date, uh, but we use the 2D because it's our working model and that's what we work from. Just for your guys' information, every time you see a little circle, that's 10 foot. So it's taking oh, a 20, okay. 20 foot. So if you see 15, okay. you know, that's 150 feet type of thing. I'm glad you brought that up because that I does. Know. Everybody asks us all the time about that. They're like, what are those little wormy things looking? I said, well, that's the drift of the, the drill. When they go down, it, it you know, will move around. And, <clears throat> and then you guys have to check it all the time to see exactly where it's going. And that makes absolute sense because you have to know, like you just said, if you hit that void, <clears throat> and you hit it at a certain level, you need to know how much drift there was so you know exactly where that, that void or wood or whatever it is 
is located. So now, now what you need to understand too is we that believe it or not, that gyro is one of the most important tools we have because that gyro really picks where we put the caissons. Because mm -hmm. again, surface location and bottom hole locations are can be 10 feet apart. Mm -hmm. And if we put a you know a very expensive case on over top the surface location, but the surface location isn't where we hit the anomaly or we hit the tunnel or the shaft or the open cavity, right. we're gonna miss the target altogether. So the gyro, in my opinion, is probably one of the most important tools, at least that I use. Mm -hmm. So and you're gyroing all the time. I gyro, yeah, we gyro yeah. all the time. Yeah. Like it's just it's it keeps the 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 drill program is probably the busiest program for me on the island. Right. One thing I can say too is when I first came to the island not knowing anything, uh I I'd, I'd had this background of watching Lord of the Rings back in the day and and then on those DVDs there's extra material and they used to show um what's his name McKellen Ian I think it's Ian McKellen uh in this little almost like golf cart thing bombing around the set with this staff and I saw this guy all over the island with this staff <laughs> now to me it was like Gandalf you know it just bombing all over the place and so that's what I started calling you privately when I when I you Gandalf know, I don't have a good yeah, beard. No, I, have, I have all kinds of nicknames on the island, but I'm picked at constantly. So, no, but nice way. Oh, it is. It's all in good fun. So, oh yeah. Yeah. Most of the time. It, seems, it seems like you get quite a team there. We are. Yeah. Yeah. We get along. If you could only, they should almost do a behind the scenes on us. At We're like waiting for that. Show. We are so waiting for that show. <laughs> yeah, we actually ask our members, like, you know, like, what questions are you going to ask or what, what would you like to ask? And one of them is, you know, when do we get to see the blooper reel or when do we get yeah, to see the exactly. picture reel? <laughs> We'd love to see that, too, because I am I mean, for my I'm sort of the I guess I'm really the new guy. Not really. Not now. Yeah, this is your fourth four season. Years, yeah. This is my fit. Like, I've been there five. You've been yeah, there four. four. But still. So we're in our own But still. And, and with my work, I'm often there for two or three days, not. Uh, five days like you folks yeah. because I have other things going on mm -hmm. but one thing that um, is you know I've worked in mining camps worked on many contaminated sites with big teams but I have never as I told Rick it is the most complex contaminated site I've ever worked on in many years the only difference is the contaminant isn't mercury it's gold and the other difference is that the people I work with are so much fun to work with. Mm -hmm. So it makes makes being involved really, really easy. Um, and that's pretty unique from my perspective. So are any of you two the two, one of the people that keep stealing Laird's phone and taking off these pictures that he was telling? Oh, that's, uh, that's Doug. Is that Doug? Was that Doug? <laughs> yeah, I think Gary might do that too. Yeah. Oh, I stole his phone one night. I did too. Yeah, we all do. Yeah. We all do. Laird leaves it around. It's his he, own fault. It's just hanging around, so you stick it in your pocket because it looks like yours. And you get home and you get this call from Laird's partner or something like that. And you're like, holy cow. I've got a phone. Yeah. Yeah, but that's Laird's fault. He leaves yeah. it everywhere. Yeah, yeah. He mentioned something about that. He said, Yeah, I goes, I got to not leave my phone laid around because I'll come back and find some. In odd pictures on it from yeah we all taking pictures i only did one thing and i just posted his feed. favorite tv personality was steve gopped on his facebook page. That's <laughs> all I did. well he said he was going to do something he was he was making a a, a a list or something of the and i'll call it he didn't say the word crap but he said crap that steve steve said oh, yeah. stuff yeah. It's stuff. stuff that steve says there's a book yeah. that floats around the island and larry keeps a, a very detailed record of stuff that i I say. And and uh, amongst the group, the most anticipated thing next to treasure will be that book. <laughs> because you know that too. We're excited about that. Oh yeah. Everybody keeps track of stuff that I I'm just full of one liners all day long. And yeah, Steve, yeah. We think he should have his own TV show. Oh, I wish, but yeah. oh, there you go. There you go. You can do this. That, and that makes it a fun that makes it a fun place to work. Oh, absolutely. We, we have a good time. What you see, I and I think the heiress as you know, the fellowship is 20 strong, right? And and it's the truth. As much as we've talked before, and we're like anybody, we bicker, but yeah. we bickered. I mean, yes, but it's because we are passionate about what we do. And th we think we're right, but but we talk it through at the end of the day, we still all go out for drinks and supper mm -hmm. and we go boating and we just, we're all great friends. And that's what makes it fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, you guys go skiing together. That's yeah, awesome. yeah. We spend you know we spend a lot of time together in work, and then we still spend time together at the end of the day because, frankly, that's all we know. We all are going to different areas, right? We yeah. all live between Chester and Mahone Bay, and yeah. we really only know each other when we're yeah. But we like each other. I mean, and that yeah. that's important. Yep. Uh, I, I think it's a really important part too. Rick is very aware of that. Mm -hmm. So when he asks people to be involved, he's he's a really, I think, a really good judge of character. Yeah. And, uh, and that, because if you get out of kilter in that environment, because the days are really long, it surprised the heck out of me. Um, and Rick is often the first person there and the last person gone. And, um, uh, and that would be seven o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock at night, yeah. sometimes later. Late. Oh yeah. So my call time for is usually about seven 30. And so when I get there, Scott's there, Rick's there. And then some nights were there till seven or eight yeah later than that some nights if we have a meeting post working all day uh we can be there to 10 o'clock at night in meetings yeah but it's, no, we, really long. we all yeah, order pizza good. and we cold pizza i was yeah, gonna say pizza. Just, just, just the amount of time steve it's going to take you to plot all those things every day oh, yeah. right oh it doesn't take long i no? when i'm surveying i have an autocad essentially an autocad uh, file in the background and i'm drafting as oh, i do okay. it and i just the straight drag and drop into autocad i do my checks on my control points Mm -hmm. It doesn't take a long time to draft. I was going to say, uh, uh, Scott Barlow's in the chat, and he said something about wanting an autograph. So you guys will have to, you know, pony up an autograph for him, I guess. So he's the famous one. No, you're the famous one. No, <laughs> you got more followers than me. <laughs> Just go well, take his phone. Just go take his phone and send him a selfie. Yeah, send him. Yeah. Yeah. Did yeah, Scott? Yeah, Scott selfie. probably put that in the chat because I think. Uh, when he's on TV, they usually have subtitles. Don't oh, yeah. They? Is Scott, sub is Scott yeah. subtitled? No. Uh, Carmen, Lay? Yeah. Carmen is sometimes. Carmen is sometimes. Yeah. We, may, we, we get after Scott because he gets subtitles. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's that PEI accent. <laughs> it is that thick PEI oh, yeah, accent. <laughs> yeah. Honest PEI accent. Mm -hmm. Well, he's a great guy. We like him a lot. One of these well, we days, like we're going to coerce him on the show. We haven't got him on the show yet, him or Doug. And and uh, even though Doug will talk with us and tell us, you know, you know, he'll answer some of my questions. Like like that day that I, I reached out to, I, I think it was uh, Laird or Steve. I, I reached out and was asking about the water levels in the in the money pit. I think it was Laird actually, and he said, "No, you got to talk to you got to talk to Doug." So I did. I sent a message to Doug, and he answered me during the show. He, he gave me a response back, which is really cool. That you know, um, they will help us out like that when we have a question about what's happening on the island, if they can. Uh, obvious, you know, if it's been aired, they can talk about it or you guys can talk about it. So and that's kind of why we wait until toward the end of the season. Yes, we have the finale coming up next week, which is great and bad at the same time, because it means now we got to wait while you guys film all summer. Hopefully there's a season 10 uh, and then you, you know, we'll uh, um, film all summer or whatever. And then, um, you know, we get to have you on after the show is over. But, you know, we got the finale coming up. Obviously, we can't really, you know, ask you questions about that. No. Um, but we do see some stuff like the muon technology it looks to us like that's coming on uh you know they talked about it early in the season they you know there was i think it was uh, episode first or second episode they showed you know the um the artist rendition of the technology going in the ground and picking up all the muons you know traveling through space and how it could find a void or something like that but we've been waiting all season to hear anything else about it and now in the preview for the season finale looks like we're going to finally get that so um hopefully that that'll have some great things for you guys to uh to work on for a season 10 if <laughs> uh we certainly hope there's going to be one um one thing that uh, you know i wanted to ask about when ian when you first came out to the island did you were you it was at the eye of the swamp that they had you come to first i'm trying to remember back now is that what the you were looking yeah. at the play yeah, the, the eye in the swamp was sort of the anomaly. If, if you look at other wetlands like that, mm -hmm. and there are a few, you know, if you go over to Frog Island there, uh, it was unique. And to me, it was unique too. So I did some homework beforehand, talked uh, with Marty and Rick and Craig. I, I worked quite closely with Craig uh, on, on that. Mm -hmm. And we came up with a plan as to what could be done because we were trying to understand what that feature was. Right. And uh, for me, it was intriguing too. I just not seen anything like that before. So that's, yeah, that's sort of where I started, and then it kind of took off from there. Right. Yeah, I know the the platform, the stone platform in the swamp was another feature that, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was neat to have you come out there. And that's that's one of the things I was going to say earlier was that 
you know, you both have been asked, you know, Steve, you five seasons or, or ago and, and Ian four, but they asked you to come out and to help do this um, investigation along. And so they, they brought your expertise out uh, for this thing. And obviously surveying is very, very important because you want to know exactly where you find everything. And also the, when the drill program, you know, how that is walking and things like that, all that has to be documented. And, and, and Ian, you coming out with your expertise, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it speaks well of both of you and the rest of the team of the people that have brought, come out, Laird included, but it also speaks well of them to know when they have somebody that has such a uh, professional uh, background to come out and to add to this. So it's really a, a great thing that they have added to the science rather than just being out there digging holes like in Dunfield or whoever, you know, they didn't have all of you, all your expertise out there um, to help aid in this search, which I think is phenomenal. Um, mm. One of the other things that you found uh, was that piece of wood in the platform. You found that piece of wood that had been smashed between two rocks. Mm -hmm. um, and then you had, you said, this is going to tell us when this road around the time frame it was constructed. It's right here. Oh, Oh, you have it right there. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, and that thing was dated like 1220 or something like that, right? Yeah, it was somewhere between, I think. We're talking the paved area. This would have yeah, been a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah, the first yeah. year. First year was 1220 there. to 1280? Yeah, yeah, that's sort of the middle date um, of it. So, you know, the great challenge is understanding how that occurs if it's not, uh, if it's not human placed. And that's where... Uh, Aaron Taylor became very important. Aaron Taylor first came out because I knew Dr. Aaron Taylor from my work on things in Nova Scotia. And I knew that he had done work in Cuba and right. archaeology in Cuba. And he had worked on areas where people had made features like that on wet ground to stabilize it. And so I needed, I said, hey, can you take a look at this and see what you think? And um, and that's that started that relationship. And and he was extremely helpful in helping me sort of take it from a possibility that it was human place, the rock there, to a probability. Right. So we always we, we work in this world of possible, probable, certain. And so a lot of things we find may possibly mean something or probably mean something or certainly definitive or definitively mean something. So right. it took it to that stage. It was a really interesting feature. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly is. And it really left us all wondering what in the world would this be for? Now, when you found the, the, the stone road coming up from, um, and you actually found it by probing and then drained the swamp and went in there and cleared it off. And then you were exactly right. You knew from, uh, I think it was Rick was taking you around in the boat and you were doing the probe. I thought you almost were going to fall in the water at that one point. Cause you were leaning out, leaning out so far. Yeah. But, yeah. uh, and then to find it when it was drained, it is, it was exactly you know, what you had said, how wide it was and about the length that you had on it. It was, it worked out to be uh, right on the money. And that was, uh, first of all, that was some great investigation to get that done. But uh, mm -hmm. again, and, and we have, we've had Aaron Taylor on the show and he's been great. Uh, he, mm -hmm. I think he might be out there tonight in the chat also, or today in the chat with us as well, but um, in yes. his, you know, adding his expertise to it again, you know, mm -hmm. a professional coming out, you know, he works in the, like you said, in Cuba, um, mm. you know, and being able to add to this, that's phenomenal. So um, I know, to, uh, Steve, you're, 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 we got a little time left with you. So I want to um, kind of throw some stuff out there uh, your way here. Um, I know we got quite a few questions. Uh, some questions here. One, one from Dick uh, says, uh, Steve, there have been many comparisons done between your more modern methods of survey versus those of Mr. Nolan. Uh, and others preceding your work, can you tell us how they have how how your results have compared to theirs? I mean, any surveyor on the island is it might be a different technology. Really depends on the time period, but the method's the same, right? I, I learned on all the instruments that Mr. Nolan would have used. Um, I'm familiar with them. I can use them today. They're just more modern. I mean, my GPS. If he had had that, he could move ten times quicker. Essentially, they take old technology and make it modern. And to this day, it continues to get better. So the methods are the same. Um, for instance, comparables, I've gone and tagged or surveyed some of Fred's old work and it's, I mean, it's bang on. So, I mean, surveyor, yeah. our tolerance is usually two and a half centimeters. So that's one inch. 
Yeah. And wow. every time I've gone in behind something that Fred has surveyed on one of his old survey plans or survey maps, it's right where it's supposed to be. So um, do we use Fred's work? I mean, it's, it's teared and I've used it and I've gone through a lot of his old plans. And I mean, it's, he does the same thing I do. He, he has more lines because he has to draw what, what's called tie lines in the survey world. Okay. Because there's not GPS to hook it to. So mine gets a 3D coordinate, an XYZ from a satellite or multiple satellites. So I'm usually connected to between 20 and 40 satellites. Oh my uh, he didn't have that technology. He used an old total station or transit. Uh, it's still great technology still does the same thing you just move about 10 times slower yeah wow so in, so in addition to just drawing let's say straight lines you're measuring from point a to point b you're also mm -hmm. checking the elevations as well that's right and he would have as well so er okay. everything that i survey on the island gets an elevation and we run uh, depending on the software we can buy certain packages to run algorithms and look for patterns and we've done that mm -hmm. and i mean that helps to, you remember maybe two years ago, it would have been the finale of season six, season seven or season eight. And I do a, uh, uh, in the final war room, I do a presentation on there. I believe there's multiple roads on Oak Island. I think I called it, uh, what did I call it? It doesn't matter. Um, but I, I did a presentation and I used the data that I collected with you and you sat down with me yeah, yeah, and it was a combination of everything. It was a combination of old aerials. It was a combination of Gary finds and it was just a combination of elevations on the island. And it helped to determine where we believe some old roads were based back based mm -hmm. on the data back then. So right. um, elevations are really important. That's what I was going to ask you. What what as a result of those checking of elevations, what interesting things did you find? Obviously, the road or potential yeah, roads. It, it helps us. It, it definitely gives us areas to look. Uh, elevation is really important in the money pit, right? So elevation of the money pit pad, for instance, is about eight and a half meters above sea level, which is about 27 or 28 feet above sea level. Okay, we were just talking about that, wondering what it was. Okay. Yeah, so the money pit pad is about 27 or 28 feet above sea level. That's really important. Right? It is. Right. So when you're 125 feet down, um, you're 100 feet, just over 100 feet, below, or about 100 feet below sea level type of thing, right? So it's important. And the water table, for instance, in the money pit is so that, 26 yeah. feet down. It's so 26, yeah. And so, that's, that's really important for us Yeah, if we're going to be uh, chasing the chemistry of the water. So elevations are important, uh, yeah. especially in archaeology work with Laird, right? He records all elevations and stuff. So elevations around the island are important. They help tell a story. Yeah, um, it, it's it, a, one of the things that's uh, most important to me about the work that Steve's done, like I'm a big fan of castles. And so I uh, have gone to, to, to Britain a few times and just to look at castles. Mm -hmm. And once, if you know anything about castles, castles are often built on top of castles. And, uh, and those castles were built on top of other castles. And I think mm -hmm. what the work with the carbon dating, with the surveying, you put that all together and what it's telling a story of is of multiple periods of use. Right. And this is not normal. Um, and it's it's use that even goes back, perhaps back in time from the I wouldn't say accepted, but a defensible time of of um, of sort of colonial contact and uh, or, or, you know, um, new folks coming to Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. uh, not indigenous folks. And so right. so that having that data has opened up the possibility that a complex series of events took place at Oak Island, sort of unique to that site too. Yep. And I don't think we would have really put that together without having that combination of age and then all the features, elevation and spatial location. Yeah. Yeah. Every, you said it earlier. I mean, Dr. Spooner said it right back when you guys first started this a half an hour ago and said, we all live in our own little world. Mm -hmm. I'm going to paraphrase, mm -hmm. uh, but we're all important, right? So Terry's work is very dependent upon my work. My work is dependent upon Terry's. My, we all, every, nobody's not part of the bubble. That's a very poorly word sentence, but we have a bubble. Mm -hmm. We all live in it and we're all, we're all attached. So yeah. Billy's work and my work, they Doug, work for us. Doug's critical. D Doug and I, and what people don't see is Doug and I are like this on the island yeah. in terms of just working together. Right. My work and Doug's work go hand in hand and we can often help the other person move along based on whatever we're doing in the moment so and then the, and scott keeps us all talking that's right and yeah. scott keeps everything flowing yeah so and believe it or not scott's and a lot of times the glue of the right. research that goes on because he keeps us all communicating he keeps if he knows a piece of information he lets us all know listen dr spooner found this doug found this steve did this terry did this 
and we're all part of like this little network. So because it's such a fast moving island, um, Scott keeps track of everything. And with that, we're all in constant communication. So at the end of the day, it's it's a really good network. And, and that's what uh, makes him such a good project manager. It yeah. Does. yeah, he's a fantastic project manager. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's got a, yeah, and he's got a lot of patience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can see why. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, I, I can see that too. It's yeah. a very busy, it's a very busy environment. And, uh, and with guests uh, there as well, uh, uh, you know, coming and doing work. Uh, and somebody's got to somehow hold that together. I mean, ultimately, Rick, Craig, Marty, um, you know, but sort of day to day, right on the ground level. Um, Scott and I would say certainly Doug too. So well, here's the I fun mean, fact, totally off random. The mm -hmm. three chattiest people on the island when the cameras aren't rolling are him, myself, and Terry. <laughs> really? Yeah, you and I, oh, for sure. You and I and Terry are the three to mm -hmm. most talkative people mm -hmm. on the island. Strange. I never thought of myself that. Really? Oh, I'm super talkative. <laughs> yeah. I think Terry's been I know you are, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ter Terry has a selfie. I think. Terry has a selfie. Yes, yes, Terry does. Really? Now, see, yeah, I would yeah. never have guessed that. That's funny. Yeah. Oh no, no. Oh yeah. Yeah, like because Terry knows everything, everything about uh, money pit uh, and the island. Oh uh, yeah, the, I can see that. Island, yeah. Right? yeah. So all, all all the maps and the charts that you do, Steve. Like, has there ever been any thought to releasing some kind of a publication or something for the general public? I mean, I know you've got a it's a treasure hunt, so things have to be very closely guarded. But in general terms, has there ever been thought of sort of compiling anything to release to the general public, you know? Uh, I don't know. That's an Oak Island Tours. Uh, when the island, okay. right, when everything is done and the Laginas are finished on the island and we we aren't part of those conversations, so we won't know when that is. We we won't know until we're told. Um, okay. I, I suspect at some point in time, the data that I've gathered over the last five seasons will be made public, but I don't know for sure. Uh, it will be in their archives. I know Rick is a big believer in sharing information and and eventually i think in like all the science uh rick has been very very good about saying at some point this uh that we won't we want to release this i mean from my perspective yeah. there's three or four academic papers i can write from the data that we've um these are peer-reviewed papers so wow. uh i've never had the opportunity to look at a wetland you know the swamp uh, in this much detail and understand things like uh, sea level rise, um, anthropogenic activity, all these things. I just never had the luxury of spending so much time in one environment to really understand it well. And he's been very good about saying at some point, um, we'd be happy for that to be in the public domain. That's awesome. So, yeah. So I don't have a clear answer to that. I suspect at some no. point in time, it would be made even at, in the museum, it might be displayed on a wall somewhere of all the survey work that we've compiled over the last four or five years. So, yeah, yeah that was one of the things that one of our uh, members, Rudy, asked about. He asked about if you would uh, write a book about your data. Um, so, I mean, and that's that's fantastic. And we know, you know, t dealing with Rick and, and, and I've never, you know, had the opportunity to meet him, but uh, maybe someday. But the thing of it is, is that, you know, he really he really wants the answers. You know, and I've said on the show before, and everybody listening has heard me say it, you know, that yes, we would love to see some great treasure be brought up out of the money pit. But the the simple fact of the who, what, why, where, and, and where, like Rick says, those answers, those questions are lingering in all of us. We want to know, just like he does. We want answers to this. There was obviously something significant going on in this island over many, many, many years who was doing it and why? What were they doing there? And that 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 answer is coming, and it's based upon all of the data that you guys have have gathered over the, the over the years. Um, it we really hope that at some point, you know, this all does get put into some sort of a you know historical data, and we could be changing North American history at the, in the process. So um, it's so very important, not just a treasure hunt, but the the answers of of true history could be resolved at this and that's that's what makes it so phenomenal i think and you guys are all part of it making it happen mm -hmm. so you know that's one of the so writing a book that would be great um one of the questions for steven also was uh um talking about the equipment can the equipment you use um 
so talking about it being purchased. Now, I don't know why anybody would want to go out and spend, because I imagine it's very expensive, but like your, your GPS that you go out, people are asking about being able to go out and, and what is it, you know, as Tom mentioned earlier, um, and is it something that's available to the general public or is it just for, you know, surveyors to, to purchase or? I mean, and even, and, and even if you did buy it, could you use it? Would you have the technical skills to self-teach well, yourself? Yeah, it depends on the, mm -hmm. so some of the, there's three big players in the survey world. It's Leica, Topcon and Trimble. Mm -hmm. um, some are more user-friendly. I like Topcon. It's pretty user-friendly. That said, it probably requires a bit of schooling. Mm -hmm. I mean, to become a land surveyor, it, depending on this college or university you go to, it's two to four years. Yep. Um, we have a high fail rate. We failed with 50% of students. So it's, wow. it's a lot of math involved. It's a lot of heavy math, a lot mm -hmm. of technology. Uh, you can, to answer your question, go buy the survey gear. It will cost you about fifty dollars to $100,000 for the stuff that I use. Um, on top of that, there's service fees that are about 200 to $300 a month to hook up to, to, the, hook up to the satellites oh, yeah. that get you the two centimeters or the one inch. And actually, most of the time, I'm in the millimeter, so oh, like wow. four to eight millimeter range. Um, yeah, you can go buy it. It's it's about <laughs> 50000 American if you want to. Yeah, to, 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 put it, to put it kind of in perspective, like I, I'm just finishing up field school here for our department. We take our students out in second year and we do mapping. And we use GPS, plus or minus about three meters. Yep, so it's a handheld of your cell phone now. And the reason that it's, it's plus or minus three meters is because uh, the the agencies that put those satellites up there don't want uh, to give out, or they scramble it just a little bit. Hmm. So there's some ambiguity. Otherwise, you know, we've seen what's going on in, in the other part of the world right now. Mm -hmm. With all the technologies available to people, if you could locate, you know, pretty well anything within two or three centimeters, well, there's a huge advantage to whoever yep. has that ability. That's true. Yep. So, so yeah, you have to pay pretty steep prices to get the kind of accuracy surveyors get. And we just call them survey corrections or corrections you, from satellites. Do you have to be a licensed surveyor to get access no nope. nope. you can pay for them you can go anybody out there could go buy that piece of equipment that i have it costs them wherever they get it let's say 30 to sixty thousand american mm -hmm. uh, that's on the low end for top con or right um and you pay 250 dollars to 300 dollars a month for the corrections and you could have the same accuracy for gps again mm -hmm. for just normal day use a handheld or your cell phone at this point in time you're three to ten feet it's probably all a normal person needs, but for the accuracy exactly. in the survey world, for legal, right? What we do is legal. Everything exactly. we record is legal. Yeah. So yep. we need that accuracy because if we end up in court, we need to prove that this X marks the spot and here it is. And uh, we need the documentation to prove that. So yeah. you, you were talking about your, your education background requirements, things like that. And I noticed in, in doing a little bit of research on both of you, a term that I have no idea what it means, geomatrics. Geomatics is a fancy word for geomatics. Is that what it is? Okay. Marine geomatics. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I have a background mm -hmm. in offshore surveying as well. So marine geomatics just means offshore surveying. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Wow. Yeah, and that's where we're. Uh, there's some interface because I run a, a master's of science at Acadia here in applied geomatics, and so I that's that. remote sensing GIS and marine geomatics. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So I, I sort of understand what Steve does. But I could never do it. You understand it really well, though, but I but I, I can't do the. There's no way. I mean, with the math and with the, just the technical skill. It's a way of seeing the world that is. I think for a geoscientist is kind of normal, but it's um, it's not for the faint of heart. Hmm. You know. Yeah, that's uh. You know, there was another question here that uh, uh, Mally was asking for uh, Steve. Um, if you could put an X on the ground and dig a 20 foot wide shaft, what location would you choose and why? Well, I would love to be able to answer that. Love it. Uh, I don't, I don't <laughs> think I can, Okay. but I have made it known in the war room that if they gave me full power to put anything where I wanted to put it, this would be my X. Unfortunately, I can't, they've all seen it in the war room, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Stay tuned. Um, yeah. Stay tuned. Yeah. yeah. All right. I, I can talk about what's aired this year. Uh, uh, the fellowship one, TF one, that was our first case on of the year, right? Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. That's where we all wrote on the case on. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I put it's here. Right. Mm -hmm. If you had asked me at the end of, before our first case on went down, I was fully convinced that's where it was. Yep. That would have been my X this year. 
Um, I sit behind the data. I look at and I breathe and eat that data mm -hmm. other than sleep for 16 <laughs> hours a day. And I can tell you based on everything, the work that Spooner has done, the work that the research has done, uh, Doug, Terry's work, Doug's work, the Doug's work, work yep. right? Everybody's work led to that spot this year. Wow. So oh, if you had asked, yeah. yeah. It Everybody. seems as though you've got you've got C one surrounded now. Yeah, we, do. we have C one surrounded. Pretty you much know, surrounded. The, the the big challenge is uh, you can say things are surrounded, but if you have let's say two feet by three feet by three feet of something, uh, because I've been looking at it from a water chemistry point of view, that's not very big. Two feet by three feet. No, it's not. Not 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 down two hundred feet. Yeah, right. right. If you yeah. fill that two by three by three, or even one, let's say, cubic yard full of gold, that's that's basically one, uh, what would that be, about two tons of gold? Probably. And you do yeah. the math, it's millions and millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And so the target it could potentially be exceedingly small. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the challenge, is is trying to to parse that out, that uh, if your holes are seven or eight feet apart, it seems like they're close. Mm -hmm. But if your target's that small. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah you know. could miss it by that much and not even know it. Yeah. That's it. I mean, yep. the for, for the research, for my research, for the work that I do on the island, uh, the most important tool for pure research is that sonic drill rig, right? Oh, yeah. that, and if Rick calls it, that's when we are the research. And when we get to the caissons, that's when we're treasure hunting. So that's when we take what we've worked on all year. Yep. And when we're ready, when we think we're ready, because we, we don't have a viable target, it's really expensive to put a put a can down. I know, can imagine. Can. And so when we believe we're ready and we believe we have the data that speaks to an area that we've never been to, um, that's when we go to the caisson. But, but again, we know that that goes back to that gyro, that gyro that I run down hole, that's 300 to a half million dollars. I think 300,000 actually. Um, it goes to that's that, how much it costs yeah that oh. becomes a very important tool because we can't miss with that case on based on the research because it goes back to the size of the treasure you know we have hundreds we have over 400 drill holes since i've been on the island that's so one of the things i was going to ask you about yeah. but again we have gone at different depths so when you get below like 130 140 we don't go a lot deeper than that sometimes so there's a lot of in the how... area under 140 feet yeah that's feet. the key thing about drill holes people don't uh, some people I don't think realize is that depth is critical too. So just because uh -huh. we have that many holes, it, depth figures into just how much uh, ground you've covered because it's a three-dimensional. Yeah, that's why the three that we keep up to date is so important because there is a lot of area in the money pit. Even though we have 400 holes, right? If the treasure is, and one of the one of the historical records say that the treasure could poten potentially be at 150 feet, uh -huh. right? Um, if the treasure is 150 feet, we haven't looked in a whole lot of area. I was going to uh, ask you, uh, because wow. some of the old historical drill records say that they've gone down 170, 180, 200, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't seem like in some of these caissons or cans that are going down, we're not going that deep. No. No, no this year, what did we go? Yeah. I mean, it's all aired. How deep did we go this year? 140. All right. Uh, the average drill this year probably went 150, uh, Sonic, and then I think the caissons went to 170 or 180. Yeah. Did it air? Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, yeah, they put the depth on for every time they do one, how, how, how far they are down, because then they say, okay, we're going to go this deep, and then we're calling it. So, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, and that's the thing, and that's the one of the frustrating things for us, you know, we're, and, and we see it in, you know, we talked about this just the other day on the show, um, or I did, I brought this up, is that, you know, it's kind of frustrating here, okay, we get so excited, like you do, about a new can going in, and here it is, it's working, working, and just like, you know, uh, we've seen Gary say, every scoop coming off from that hammer grab is exciting. Everybody wants to see what it has. And then they get down to the bottom and they hit bedrock and it's all done. Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, we're done. We didn't find anything in that. And you see the, you see the expression on, on everybody's faces. And we're thinking the same thing too. We're watching this. We're going, Oh, another case on it. We didn't, didn't get any treasure or didn't find an answer from it, you know, and it, but it, it's, it's like now we get to experience exactly what, all of you feel when the caisson gets down to the bottom and boom, it hits bedrock and there's nothing there. And now you got to pull it back up and fill it, you know, fill it back, fill the hole in. Yeah. So we're feeling that as well, but it's like, everybody's like, Oh, it's so disappointed about another show with nothing. Imagine how they feel. Uh -huh. you know, we're seeing it real time. That's what reality TV is. We're seeing this not real time, of course, because you did it last year, but 
we're we're feeling it exactly you know the the disappointment that you all feel when that happens so you know it that's that's the that's one of the things that people just sometimes watching the show just don't realize and it's like you know we have to we get excited about it now there's a fifth can would we all thought there was only going to be four up to four we had a little contest on our facebook uh, group page and said okay how many do you all think there's going to be some said one so i said two and then there was four so i was completely wrong and now there's the fifth one going in and we have high hopes for it we'll see next week um you know what happened on tuesday night we'll find out i, I know it's sunday night for you guys but then but uh, on tuesday night we'll get to find out if anything was found in this fifth location hopefully some kind of answer will come up out of it but it, it may be another disappointment and you know move on to something else we'll find out but there, there will probably be some sort of a cliffhanger we're, we're kind of figuring on that that usually does happen um a question for for uh, either one of you uh, maybe uh, ian it's about the maroon till. We hear Terry quite often say something about maroon till. Mm -hmm. What exactly is maroon till? This was a question from Barb, or I'm sorry, from Sherry. I was asking what what is it? What does he mean by maroon till? Well, it, you know, it's it's kind of something I talk about in my class, my uh, my quaternary class that uh, actually that uh, Dr. Aaron Taylor taught uh, this year. But um, on Oak Island, there's two tills, so all that uh, points towards is two glacial advances cover the bedrock. Mm -hmm. And one of them is brown and one of them is maroon. And Terry's delineated those very nicely. Um, and it, it's the source rock from over which that glacier traveled colors the till. Okay. And so one of them has a little bit more of a signature, I think, of far traveled rocks. If you've ever been to Nova Scotia, you got the Bay of Fundy, it's all red, that kind of thing. So it gives it a more reddish color. And the brown till has more of um, a signature of the slates in the area. So, oh, okay. so that, that those two tills are equally compact, super compact, but that's why we have, when we're going down the holes, we know where we are, mm -hmm. or Terry knows where he is and Steve knows and Craig um, by the color of those tills. And so they're two, we call them stratigraphic units. Very okay. consistent, very consistent on the Island. And it and that'll kind of help you know a level too. Are they are they cer at certain levels? Yep, and it and and it it, it also helps us understand a little bit about uh, historically when people were putting down shafts. Right, they right. recognize this as well, and in some of their notes, they refer to that. So we can kind of at a certain spot be on the same page, if you will. Yeah. Oh, we keep track of all this. So when I'm building the database, uh, Terry's notes detail. Uh, each layer very well. So, you know, the first seven feet are Irving pad, we call it. It's the pad we built so we can put the caissons in. Right, right. And then from there on out, it's just this layer, this layer, this layer, this layer. And if we want to in our 3D model, we just go click and it shows us very detailed of when we've come into each layer. And the maroon till is one of those layers. And, and we keep track of that for many reasons. Some of it historical, some of it is just what water will flow through. Mm -hmm. Because oh, if we have yeah. a water problem in a hole, we have to know when we're in a particular um type of bedrock or till or ground or mm -hmm. subsurface material let's call it subsurface material will water flow through that and yep. that's important to the research as well mm -hmm. so 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 do you find that water starts to seep in at varying levels or is it all kind of at that 26 foot level well, the, so the, the water table is at the 26 foot low so 26 mm -hmm. foot down under the money pit pad which is 27 or 28 feet above sea level that's where the water table is mm -hmm. and that's very consistent through every hole mm -hmm. so the water table itself is at 26 feet but that really just tells us how high the water in the hole rises to that's right mm -hmm. but not necessarily where water is coming in from where yeah. it's introduced from it, introduced from and and experiences that it, it's introduced way deeper than that mm -hmm. wow yeah that's and that's something that, you know we you know looking at c1 and that, as we mentioned earlier that you guys have now put a case on around pretty much well f4 i think or the one that was quite is a bit south uh, of uh, of the C1, but the other ones are right, like right bumping up against it almost. And, you know, C1 was so very important because not only did, if I remember correctly, it has a, a void down there uh, mm -hmm. that they sent the camera down and we saw some sort of like wrought iron or something down there. It looked like wrought iron pieces laying around on the, on the, on the floor. So there was a void down there, but also because of the testing that you uh, and Matt did, Ian, and, mm -hmm. and was able to come up initially at the end of the one season. And I loved how you posed that question at the, in the uh, in the war room at the table. It's like, do you believe there's treasure on Oak Island? 
and Marty was like, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah well, it's great. Yeah. And to a certain extent, I mean, what surprised the heck out of me, I think all of us was, uh, we never really thought, um, uh, I don't think there was much thought of sampling water mm -hmm. to help us uh, identify what was going on yeah. uh, at the money pit. Because frankly, the reason why silver and gold are precious metals and why we wear them on our bodies is because they don't corrode. Right. And we don't have, many of us have iron rings or things that are, even copper would be a little bit better. So yeah. you'd never expect it to show up in water um, as an indicator of, uh, you know, gold right. or silver at depth. And so when we did come up with very significant levels of precious metal in the water, that was a huge, huge surprise uh, yeah. to me. I've And Terry too. Terry, uh, he sampled, Terry's a hydrogeologist. Terry's, uh, and that's his living. And he, he knows the water. He knows water is as, as good as anybody in its chemistry. So Terry's super surprised. I was super surprised. We talked to experts um, outside of our own sort of sphere and they were all surprised. And, and so that's something that we've, um, you know, we continue to chase uh, because it's just not what we'd expect at all in that environment. Mm. Yep. It's one, one more question we had come in there is, is the maroon color till above or below the uh, brown till? I'm pretty sure it's below. Oh, yeah. yeah. Does it go brown, uh -oh. maroon, maroon, then gray? Then the gray, yeah, yeah. I Maybe think like, so. I yeah. think. And, you know, <laughs> where's, Terry? Where's, Terry? where's Terry? Where's Terry? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where's Terry when you need him? <laughs> we needed him to come on. We wanted to be I got to take off in like five minutes. You want to fill in nope. the next hour really well. We'll get Terry on the line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to. <laughs> yeah, We've been I trying to get Terry to come on, and he, he was like, oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, like Steve, I know you got to go. Thanks a lot, pal, for coming in. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. One, if you guys are done with me, I can probably take off. Well, right one, now. one last question before uh, for you sure. before you go. Um, and this is this is kind of and when we'll ask the same question of Ian after after you're gone. But now, obviously, you guys, you've been all over the island. You've, you've done GPS coordinates all over the island, and you've had meticulous maps and survey maps and everything made that are fantastic. Uh, you know, we look at them and we're kind of like, eh, I don't know what all I'm seeing here, but you know, and then you explain all that to us on the show. Um, but knowing all of this and all of the research that you have done, is it the money pit or where else would you want to really investigate on the Island? This was a uh, Ramona had put this out. He said, if you were uh, to do your own research, if you were given free will to go out on the Island and just start searching somewhere, where would this point or place be on the island? Would it be the money pit or somewhere else? Uh, so I'm going to assume that I have unlimited resources with that question. Yep. Yes, um, yes. Because yep. I'm a big, I would love to have unlimited resources. But if I did, <laughs> I would work uh, Swamp East. So I go back. There's a lot of work to do in the swamp. I love the work Spooner's done in the swamp. We start there. I'm a big believer that there's multiple roads on the island. So the roads begin in the swamp. They end in the money pit. We would chase every last one of them. Um at the end of the day, I do believe the treasure's in the money pit. You may find out come Tuesday night if we find it. Uh, if not, I still <laughs> believe one of these roads leads to the treasure. So for me, uh, I'm this. I could talk an hour about that question, and I love that question. For mm -hmm. me, there's still work to do in the swamp. There's still roads to find. And, and I think that points to Rick a lot mm -hmm. in the who, when, where, yep. why, mm -hmm. and then finally the what. Yep. Um, because that work ultimately will help. Like if you go, if you, if you drill down, you a bunch of coins come up that doesn't often answer a lot of those questions, right? Really at right. the heart right. of this whole thing. It's what's kept me going in many ways as a scientist are those other who, yep. when, where, well, mm -hmm. the where, what, uh, and to answer those questions, it's probably more than just the money bit. Oh, it is. So for me, it's a story. And, and it can go even farther, like Samuel Ball, his interaction with yes. the island. Yes. It goes back oh, to yeah. Lot 8, lot, inter lot of data, Lot 8 this year. Um, so there's a story to be told on Lot 8, which is the western portion of the island. But for me, unlimited resources. I would do Lot 8. I would jump to the swamp, right? So it's a bit of a jump through mm -hmm. Lots 9 through 12. Then we're going to jump in the swamp. Um, and I'm going to really do... Swamp right through the Smith's Cove. Now, Smith's Cove work, we've done a lot of work in previous years. I have a ton of data. Yeah. But for me, it's to sit down, 
after I would do the investigation that I want to do. There's still a lot of work to do in the swamp. There's still a lot of roads to find between lots 12 and the money pit, which is 18. And uh, let's follow some of these roads to the money pit. So at the end of the day, I want to tie in all the, the work. I think at this point in time, we have potentially three different periods going on in the island. We have oh. potentially 12, 13, 1400s, uh, maybe 14, 15, 16, and then we know 1700 for sure. Oh. So we potentially have three different time periods. I want to see, you know, deposit at one point in time. Was there, uh, you know, maybe in the 1700s, an attempt to recover? We don't know. Uh, right. Yeah, see. Uh, we're thinking it was a failed attempt, potentially maybe in the 17. I, I'm speaking for me. I right. think maybe a failed uh, recovery effort in the 1700s. But again, I need more resources to look into these. So for me, it goes swamp to Smith's Cove. I do believe the treasure's in the money pit. Awesome. That's great. And that's kind of what we think too. There's, there's our, our people that, you know, one of the things I say on the show once in a while is pull the plug. I always said, you know, there's uh, the eye of the swamp, got the blue clay. You know, I know Ian said, you know, it's a, it looks probably like a blue clay mine. Um, but I'm thinking, no, if it's sealing something up, pull that plug, get down there, find out what's in that hole, you know, and there's others that kind of feel that way about the swamp, but at the end of the day, it's probably the money pit. And some people have said, nope, it's a ruse. It's not the money pit, but I, I, it's very interesting to hear your answer about that and the roads. Mm -hmm. Um, cause some people are kind of poop, you know, poop on them on the roads a little bit. I'm no, like, no, 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 no. The roads are tell the story. We, we yeah, need to know I, a lot more about those roads. No, those roads are completely, uh, what we call the stone road and the cobble path. Those are unique. Yep. And, um, as we like to say, it's not farmers and fishermen who built those. <laughs> exactly. Definitely some sort of, I can tell us, I can tell us from here. Yeah. Well, yeah exactly. There's a, there's some sort of Oak Island interstate, I call it, and we need to figure out what that is. I said, exactly. that's what I call it. Exactly. I never heard that before. <laughs> the Oak Island interstate. There's an Oak Island interstate, and we need to figure there's that the out. There's the I-95 Oak Island. So, uh, <laughs> oh, I-95. Route 66, Route 66 of Oak Island. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah. Well, Steve, thank you so much. I know you got to run, and I don't want to keep you, but thank you so much for being on today. Yeah, this is for having me. We'll, uh, we'll do this again soon. Yeah, and I'll see you. Yep. You'll see, will you'll see I, me all the time. I, will I see you again? You see me all the time. Okay. So, um, yeah, Ski season is coming up in the six months. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me, guys. It's always fun. Um, I hope I answered your questions. If you not, uh, just send them through email and uh, chat, and I can, I'll can i answer what I can. Okay. I'll have you back more and expand on your theory. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, actually, you know, I would like to talk. Give me an hour and I could talk about that and the data that I've got. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to stop them, I don't think. No, I, I, I'm, I'm up for it. I'm totally up for that. The best questions I've had because I'm very passionate about that. Um, I think the story is told somewhere between the swamp, not somewhere. The story for me is the swamp, the Smith's Cove, which the money pit is in between that. Right, right. Um, lot 15 is very important. We've done a lot of work on lot 15. That's where we find what we believe potentially to be the pine tire kiln. What about right, Simcoe? Right. Uh, so we haven't done a lot of work, but yeah, South Coast, it, it falls in there, right? Yeah. So the work for me, essentially lot eight, then you go into the swamp, which is lot 11, 12 through to 20. And that's where the story is for me of Oak Island. And I, I honestly could sit here for two hours and fill you in on what I think, where I think what we've done and where it is. So, um, yeah. uh, give me unlimited resources and, uh, I could fill you in some more. So, <laughs> I might have to hold you to that because I'd love to have you come on and tell us about that. That would be fascinating. And I know that everybody watching would love to watch, you know, hear that as well. That would be great. So what, again, thank you so much. And I, you know, yeah, that's uh, I'm going to keep an eye on that spot. I, you know, cause like I said, some people think, no, it's, it's somewhere else on the Island. They're looking in the wrong spot. And I, I it's good to hear you say that it really truly is because that's where the efforts have been so much. Again, that's my opinion, right? I'm not saying I'm right. Right. I'm saying I think I'm right, but right. I'm not saying I'm right. Um, that said, I do get the privilege of sitting behind that data 24 seven. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of information that not only have I collected, but I remember I get the data from everybody. So everybody that comes yes. in goes into our master database. Right. So everything that you've seen this year with the offshore data, the onshore data, um, you know, the anomalies, the VLF, uh, the magnetic, um, the magnets, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Spooner's data, everybody's data. Carbon goes, dates. Yeah, they go into the data set that I sit behind. So at the end of the day, I'm really fortunate that I'm the person that gets to read the data daily. So, Everything. yeah. Um, wow. And that's where the story is truly. So, that's awesome. Yeah. So I, I've, uh, yeah. I, I mean, if you get, I could take a non-believer and make them a believer like that, just sitting behind the data. 
You've already look at me. You know, I'm an example. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So I'll finish with that. I could okay. take a non-believer okay. and make them a believer really quick. If they right. if they can put their eyes on what I put my eyes on. So yeah. Wow. And I hope that this someday, like you said, I, I certainly hope that someday this does get to be put together uh, in layman's terms so that somebody like me can understand it. But that would be fantastic, quite honestly. Um, yeah, I'm going to we're going to have to talk about that and have you come back on at some point, maybe over. Well, I know you get so busy in the summer. It's a really hard to hopefully you're busy this summer <laughs> um, to have you come back on and, and talk about that, because that would be fascinating, in my opinion. Wow. Thank you so much. Dave. Yeah, really thanks appreciate for having me. Good yep. luck. Yeah, have yeah, fun. yeah, yeah. You no, guys I'll will see. have fun with him. Now that I'm gone, you'll get. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's some you. of those keeping stories? Yeah, see, uh, yeah. yeah, that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we can talk about Steve now. He's gone. Yeah. <laughs> talk about him all the time. <laughs> no, it's it, it's actually fun being with Steve because uh, what you know, Doug, Steve, and uh, I live pretty close together, so we actually spend a lot of time in the uh, what I call the off season just. Getting together, talking about things, getting our heads wrapped around, thing, uh, around things. Often we'll get requests too from from uh, the owners, from like Rick, Marty, Craig, and uh, to take a, a second look at stuff. So we're close to each other. Like I said, Steve and I used to play hockey together, which blew me away. <laughs> when, I, when I saw the picture, uh, it was Steve's dad who picked that up. And uh, and we looked at each other. Oh, my God. Five years of playing hockey together, and we, we, we couldn't remember it. But maybe he says something right there, but. No. Uh, he's a great guy and he's super passionate and uh extremely hard worker too yeah you can you can hear the passion in his voice when he talks yeah. about some of the things that he does there and that's interesting to note you know everybody you know so many times and i've talked about this on the show is that <clears throat> we don't get all the data we don't get all the information that takes place on the island we see this in little 40 43 minute segments each week excuse me, throughout the season. And that's why we love having folks like yourself coming on the show because you explain this in a little bit more detail to us. So now, and it's, it was like Doug sharing some of that information with me when I posed a question to him about the water levels in the swamp. I was thinking about the head and shaft. And when they put down the head and shaft and they were putting that metal down at the mm-hmm. bottom that was recently right. brought up on the show, sure. and they brought it up with the hammer grab. And I thought, well, they were down there putting that metal in. There was no water. Mm-hmm. So were they were they pumping the heck out of it or has things changed on that water level over the years? Right. And Doug right. said, no, they were pumping the heck out of it, apparently. Right. They were. Yeah. And, and I mean, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, sort of full disclosure is I've learned a lot about the, uh, the money pit the last two years because I got a little more involved in that, mm-hmm. but it is a exceedingly complex place with all the, the workings there. And you, so you have both time, So, you know, some people back in the 1800s, some people in the 1900s, now us, Dunfield dig, um, shafts and addits. So not just shafts, but addits, Uh, stuff like flood tunnels, um, uh, if and where they are, connectivity, 10x, where does that connect to? There's all sorts of things going on. And, you know, between Craig and Steve and and Scott, uh, those folks really, really and know what's going on but i think we all agree it's just incredibly complex to put that story it's a 3D together. puzzle it's a 3d yeah, puzzle it really. really is it really is and in time too so 3d in space and then you have the time like the fourth dimension it's a multi-dimensional mm-hmm. <laughs> problem and that's where steve comes into it is because he can integrate that with gis technology it's really hard to do it if anybody's ever seen the matrix it's kind of like a bunch of numbers, you know, and so you just yeah, don't know yeah. what's going on yep. until you somehow visualize that. And Steve gives us that capability. Yeah. And it takes a certain kind of mind to be able to do that and put that all together. But you have your expertise as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it was like you coming up with the idea. And I wanted to ask you about this a little bit. You know, when you when you decided to go around and take the water samples right, and, and test them, where did that, was that your original idea? Did you come up no. with that or how did that No, go? it was Rick's. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's, it was another of the great lunch episodes. <laughs> and, uh, it, it, well, we have lunch and we, we kind of, you know, the first little bit that I was on, I was quite nervous because, you know, it's a TV show and, and Rick is, uh, he's, he's a, uh, you know, well-known strong personality and, and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and, uh, 
I, I, you know, I just didn't want to impose myself on anything. But as I've got more comfortable mm -hmm. there, we talk a lot. And uh, Craig, Rick, Marty, Doug, and we throw ideas off each other. And Rick just said, hey, um, have we, we ever, what, what do you think of doing some sam some water sampling? Like, yeah, you think uh, that might, I said, well, my perspective on that was, you know, silver or gold, it, it wouldn't show up in the water. It just would never show up. We're not going to see anything there. Yeah. But perhaps we might see some copper and zinc because pieces of eight have a fair bit of copper and zinc in them. Yep. And so if there was uh, something buried there, let's look for the copper and zinc anomaly that wouldn't normally be in water in that environment. And so we did a Pathfinder study with uh, Dr. Lukeman, Matt Lukeman, a chemist yep. here. Yep. And Matt was great. Uh, he's a brilliant guy. And uh, lo and behold, not only was there the copper and the zinc, but there's silver in the water, right? So all of that, uh, I wouldn't have done it without Rick asking the question and that's what wow. has been really really eye-opening for me as an educator is that it's one thing to sort of sit with your academic cronies and come up with ideas um but you got to listen to everybody yeah. especially with people who have a lot of experience in the area where you're working mm -hmm. and they don't have to be professors or and they just have to be engaged and so I've, I've constantly been impressed with, with the ideas that whether it's Doug or you know, Scott, it doesn't really matter. Rick, these folks are all extremely invested in this yeah. and very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. So they throw ideas. I'm just really the straw person who takes the sample, takes it to the lab, gets the data back and goes, wow, like what's happening here and then of course everybody looks at me and says well you tell us you're the scientist <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah so well, let me ask you this then when you when you sure. were taking the, the water samples you had some graduate students with you or some yeah students? yeah yep. so like how did you pick them and how did you swear them to secrecy <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> well actually when we were doing the work in the eye and the swamp uh, what happened there was was great i was asked to do some work i said look I, i've got five days i can sort of devote to this and I said, is it okay to bring my students? Because I thought, what better place to train them mm -hmm. on various techniques and coring? And it was Lauren, Chelsea, and Brett, and uh, Brett Pettit. And we, uh, so they said, yeah, yeah. Like, this is the thing is, you know, they say, absolutely. Rick said, absolutely. Love to have students here. He, he, he loves that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And so down we came. And it was a great experience for those folks. Some of them were very aware of uh, of the production, um, the TV show, and and yet they were all, uh, you know, they're, they're students that um, have capability in that. So it was an opportunity to train them, mm -hmm. but also we would go back at the end of the day and we'd be able to, in the vehicle, uh, talk amongst each other, uh, the ideas that we had. Um, so I love working with other people because you're throwing ideas off each other. You're sort of refining what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and they were very good about understanding that, um, that there was, uh, you know, there were certain limitations in, in, in what we really could, could talk about or disclose. And frankly, there was a little bit of a timeline too, because we have to do all the analysis yeah. in the lab. So the five days there was also uh, sort of, reinforced by quite a few days in the lab doing the analyses, mm -hmm. but they all really enjoyed it. And at the end of the day, it's just another science uh, project for us. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, with, with that whole umbrella of everything else going on. Mm -hmm. So I came in a little bit ignorant um, and a little bit reticent, you know, like, whoa, you know, this is not what I do, but yeah. uh, it's, I gotta admit, people made it very easy to feel welcome, and that's uh, that was a huge part of uh, continuing work in that environment. Yeah, we get that so much from the show, and that's one of the things that everybody that I've had on, whether mm -hmm. it be a researcher uh, or somebody like yourself who's on the island all the time, right. or most a lot of the time, is that you know they for, for one they said no, the show is not scripted. And number two, what you see on the show is how everyone is. And that's something that we, 
you know, I've talked about it here, but we get the impression that everybody that is there is a person of integrity. Nobody's going to be going and, and planting things to find or anything like that. They truly are discovering as you go along and we get to witness it in the show. And that's what's the beauty of it is. It's that, you know, oh, you know, because you get you get naysayers that, oh, that's all fake. They're just planting stuff. No, no, I, no. I, I disagree 100 percent. Yeah. Well, and I think what's really important is people like in my mind, at least, uh, whether it's Doug, we all have we all have other lives. Mm -hmm. um, and we're professionals in those. Like I'm a professional geoscientist. I have to conform to the ethics of the, uh, you know, I can't be jumping around telling stories. Right. And so no that's it's different it's it's very very there's a lot of integrity well you can and, do a professional career along here too right exactly. you know? well, yeah and for me for me what i mean i've talked to rick and marty a fair bit about this steve too but part of the uh part of the interest is it's not that many places where you can talk science to a a crew of people that aren't at a conference or in a classroom yeah. and you can show i think how science can really inform and enhance um something like uh, what rick and marty and craig are trying to do yep and uh i've been very very encouraged by all the emails i get from folks um asking questions and uh, you wouldn't believe some of the ideas that i get which are yep. extremely good yep and um some of those folks who got in touch with me are now actively involved because wow. I said, Hey, that's great. I never thought of that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, wow. wow. And, uh, and so I get in touch with that person and I, and, and then they're, um, they're an expert in an area that we really need some help with. Yeah. So, Absolutely. yeah, there's a lot of openness to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was somebody that, uh, Indy's antics, he came up and he said something about the Gerhardt dump truck full of silver. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he said that would make a great uh, T-shirt design, and it would. It would. Be, it would, and that was a great statement because, and 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 as Tom has said before, and Tom Tom drills down to the science, you know, you talked about that being a Gerhardt dump truck full of of silver, based upon the science. Mm -hmm. This is what you found, and you put it all together. So you know that. You know, it's not your opinion. It's your opinion. Well, it is kind of, but it's your opinion based upon the science that you right. have. Yeah. At, at the end of the day, uh, that was funny because we, we'd been talking about that. And the question amongst people was, well, the silver that we're seeing, is it just a few coins? You know, I said, no, no, no. Well, then what is it? Like a few coins or, you know, you have to have something to, to, to kind of throw off people like uh, throw around and that was um you know a, a funny and i'm sure billy appreciated it but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah a funny way of just saying no it's an awful lot and right. if you're gonna have exactly. silver and water especially that water uh water that is moving around a lot that's being replenished so you know rain falls it moves through the soil it moves through the area and then it goes out to sea it doesn't necessarily spend a lot of time in contact with whatever's down there right. that's why you generally just don't see silver in water and uh so it can't be a few coins. If it is indeed coins, if it is, it's got to be a lot. And uh, and I'd say that silver, it's it's still something that uh, that I'm act very actively interested and involved in. And then you came back right around, and I think it was the beginning of of season nine, because um, we left at season eight talking about the silver content in the water, and now we come back to season nine at the very beginning. I think it might have been even episode number one. Now you're working with, and I who oh, I'm going to say his name wrong, Pierre. Yeah, uh, Pierre, Paul. Dr. Pierre Pouffal. Yeah. 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 And now you're talking about gold found in the water based upon some science that he does. Tell us a yeah. little bit about that. Yeah, well, well, that that's a that's a really interesting thing. So when and we found gold the doesn't silver, corrode, right? So pardon me, sorry. The gold doesn't corrode. So how would it get that? You know, right. And more importantly, gold is right more down. stable than silver. So right. the issue with silver is that it does corrode. You know, we all have to polish the silver, if if you will. Yep. And that just tells us that uh, under normal conditions, it can change what we call its habit chemically. So, so silver can be tricky. And what we noticed is, you know, we sample a drill hole and there'd be silver and then we'd sample it again there'd be no silver really and yeah and so what's that tell what that's telling us is that the, the condition of the water we're sampling is changing 
and that can happen when you're drilling nearby or when there's a lot of rain or mm -hmm. so the, the idea was well can we look at gold and i think uh i don't know i'd have to ask rick for sure i think rick brought that one up again too because i wouldn't because in my mind it's absolutely impossible to find gold in water mm. it just doesn't happen right you know and it, because gold is extremely stable and you have to have rather extraordinary conditions to liberate it and make make what we call a free element uh, so it's floating around the water so yeah so they can be detected right yeah otherwise it's in its solid form like a nugget you know or a coin right. mm -hmm. something like that so i was talking to dr pufal who's a colleague he used to work at acadia now works at queen's university runs a big lab there mm -hmm. and he had a colleague who um did his PhD uh, a number of years ago, looking for gold mines using water. Wow. And so the idea was their lab was equipped and it is an extraordinary lab. It's called the Kufer lab uh, with state of the art equipment. Their lab is equipped to detect golden water. Now there are commercial labs that can do that too. It's become a bit of a thing to explore for gold mines using water. Right. And so we thought, okay, okay. Let's just send off some samples to Qfer. They'll come back. There won't be any gold. This has been my the bane of my existence is, oh, there's nothing in that swamp. <laughs> Something shows up. And then there was <laughs> nothing in the water. And then the stuff yeah. showed up in the water. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I said to Dr. Pufal, can you analyze those? Sure. Yeah. We'd be happy to. It's complex. And then, so we... Uh, we sent the samples off and then it was wow like totally unexpected yeah um, and so so yeah i mean it, it was it, it was good mm -hmm. but it's it's just added another layer of complexity to the right. whole story um and it's a big part of 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 what we were involved in last year is trying to to chase this down. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of that gold, I mean, and there's some people that have speculated that maybe there is no treasure at all, that it was simply a gold mine mm -hmm. uh, and there was gold in the water. We know the gold river being very close by and yeah. quite a few, you know, uh, quite a few uh, pounds of gold were taken out of there sure. over the years in the past. So they right. said, well, maybe it's just a gold, you know, gold veins down there and that's what's putting the gold, but that doesn't answer for the silver. It, it doesn't work. It, the rock underneath there is not compatible. I was, I was going to say that because normally you'd look for quartz if you're looking for gold, wouldn't you? Yeah, you know, quartz in Nova Scotia, the the, the gold and um, the mineable gold is found in the uh, in the slates mm -hmm. in the Maguma group and uh, in, in the veining and in what's called a reef saddle deposits. And basically, when you have the the slates and they're bent, and at the top of the bend you get stress and cracks and hot fluids moved in there with the gold. And so there's gold taken out there. But the issue with that is that if the gold's in some kind of rock, the water has to interact with it and it has to have surface area to actually get any of that gold into the water. You need surface right. area. And so the rocks underneath the money pit are incompatible with, uh, with the gold being in the rock. Um, so that was a non-starter. Uh, Terry and I talked that over quite. So, so yeah, that's why, you know, then you start asking yourself, okay, it's not in the rock. Uh, where is it? And um, it's not in the till um, because the till has no water in it. Right. That's why they were able to put yeah. shafts down to, you know, 80, 90 feet and didn't even have to crib them. It was like, you know, it was very cohesive there. They're very, very what we call tight tills. Water doesn't travel through them. Okay. So that doesn't work either. So now we're starting to get into very interesting territory as to how do you produce anomalous gold and water? About the same amount of gold that you'd expect with a economic gold mine without having the gold in the rock wow. and the gold is not in the glacial till. So if you can answer that question, give Rick a call and please. Call. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking, I'm thinking I don't need his number right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it's, it's, for me, it's fascinating. And this is, I think a really important thing. And my folks in my, my, um, 
in my area of study, you know, they're, 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 they're supportive is that this is a really, really, really interesting science problem we're dealing with here. Yeah, well, for sure. And, uh, and, and we're very thankful for the folks at Queens who are able to do the work to, to identify, because we're looking at parts per billion of gold in the water. Um, and yet those parts per billion are, are quite anomalous. There's a question from one of our uh, viewers that are watching right now um, for you. And it says, an, an answer I've always asked um, or always wanted to hide gold coins um, would immersing these coins in liquid mercury uh, disfigure their origin? Yeah, a good question. That's a really good question. And um, one of the things that interests me is that, uh, well, first of all, the mercury is used when you have, let's say, placer gold, like mm -hmm. um, Gold Rush, that show. Mm -hmm. Yep. In, in the old days, uh, which I really love watching because I, I used to work in that area. Oh, really? Uh, wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I worked in Atlin and um, I worked uh, in northern BC and often involved with as a graduate student. Wow. And so my wife and I actually panned and made extra a little extra money while we were was doing my PhD, panning old workings of a placer mine and using the mercury that was already there. And what happens is mercury attracts gold to it. Oh, and okay. then what you do is you pan off the mercury mm -hmm. and off everything, leave the mercury. It's like a glob of mercury in your pan. And then you, all you have to do is take a little Bunsen burner or a Coleman stove and that um, vaporizes the mercury and the gold's oh, wow. left behind. Wow. But okay. the mercury doesn't actually disfigure the gold uh, significantly. Mm -hmm. And so what's been of interest to us is, um, if there was actual refining of gold, something like that, at uh, on Oak Island, then we'd also expect to see mercury there as well. Because in those days, now it's used as very, it's pretty rarely used mercury with gold, working with gold. It's just so toxic. Right. It, but in the old days, every uh, explorer had mercury with them to test stuff like beach sands and whatever to see if there was gold there because the gold's attracted to the mercury then you drive the mercury into a vapor and the gold's left behind wow yeah and yeah and he also and one of the and part of the extension of that question and of course has mercury accurately been detected in the money pit area do you know about that oh okay <laughs> moving on Let's move out of the money pit for a second and back to this one. Yep. Uh, a couple of years ago, season eight, there was some charcoal found on the stone road. And it was, yes. said, at the time, oh. it was said at the time that they were going to send it away for testing for pore samples and mm -hmm. spore samples, things like that. There you go. Oh, there it is. Yeah, and it, it wasn't charcoal. It's coal. Coal, okay. okay. Coal like you put in a in a train, uh, you know, a oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, cool. right. Yeah. yeah, there's, there's one of the pieces that mm -hmm. right there. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yep. So there, I, I, did they talk about that at all on, on, uh, Oh, the last I've ever heard was that it was going to be sent away. Now, whether it was ever sent away or not, I don't know. Or even yeah. something you can't talk about. That's fine too. I don't know that. It, I don't think I, like I, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, completely familiar with what they've shown, but, uh, I can say we did send it away. Okay. And I, you know, Steve was talking about his interest in tying it all together. Mm -hmm. And Steve, uh, I would say Steve and Doug in particular have such an incredible perspective on the history of the features. Uh, and, and, you know, of course, when we say Steve and Doug, we also mean absolutely Craig, Marty, and Rick. Oh, yeah. Craig, sure. yeah. yeah. Uh, but in terms of the, the, the sort of the worker bees, um, that the the coal that was found figures very 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 importantly into that story mm -hmm. um okay. in my perspective i think one of the challenges is that there's so many things that are discovered and, and a story can only be told of of some of them before it's, i i kind of call it the red riding hood complex mm -hmm. you know red riding hood went down through the forest and then went to the cottage and then you know there's a wolf and all that but mm -hmm. if you start telling all the things that she did going through the forest and she saw this person said hello to that person mm -hmm. all that may be important uh to red riding hood but not maybe to the central story right and so i think 
a, a time that's appropriate, there, okay. there's probably a bigger story to say about that. But, okay, we'll leave it go there then. But I just let I just say it's it is very important. Yeah. Okay. In telling, we'll leave, it. We'll leave in, it go there. In telling the the who. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's what I was wondering too. Yeah. And finding that around in that area, I mean, you know, you imagine, I was imagining it being that it's coal and not charcoal, but, you know, finding it, you know, the, the, um, falling off of a wagon or a cart or, a, you know, whatever. And then that's why you guys are finding these samples because it fell off and they weren't going to stop and pick them all up. They were just going to go on and, you know, and use them. So, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So that, that leads to a story. It's a clue. It's another clue. It's another clue. And it's very, there are so many clues because so many different people are working. Gary doing his work. Yep. Paul, uh, Paul Troutman does very important work. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack. Uh, one thing, uh, you know, I always like to give a shout out to Jack because I don't think we'd ever understand the stone road as well as we would if it weren't for Jack. Cause Jack, really? did, he did an incredible job almost single-handedly cleaning that off. Wow. wow. And finding all the coal uh, people might he's one of the hardest workers i've ever seen jack and very very committed mm -hmm. um you know to to just helping move the story forward so jack that was covered in mud and water and 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 we had to be careful because of artifacts you know we couldn't right. just blast it with water right and so we're working with laird and, and and aaron taylor too to make sure that we weren't compromising this feature but jack was super important so most of the coal that we found was really Jack finding it. That's a, that's, that's really interesting. Mm. It truly yeah. is. You know, we, and we, I know Linda hollers at him sometimes too, you know, through the TV as, as we all do. Sometimes we, you know, we have our opinions and when the show is on, we're giving our opinions out loud in our living rooms. And I know most <laughs> people are guilty with that as, as well as yeah. me. But when we see Jack at the, at the wash table, yes. you know, he's got that fire hose and it's like, you're blowing little pieces of parchment clean off the table, dude. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I no, no, Jack's the, the thing about Jack is he's got an incredible eye mm -hmm. as does Rick. Mm -hmm. Um, like Rick, he just kind of wanders by and says, Hey, what about that? And I go, Oh my God. Like, how'd you see that? You know? Um, <laughs> but the two of them are like that, but Jack's very, very careful and he's yeah. got this eye. And so, you know, I think it's like anything, uh, you know, in sport, you see somebody who's really done something, many times do it very quickly and rapidly. How do they do that? Right. Yeah. But Jack's been working in that environment for a long time. And especially with the stone road, he, and I work with him uh, in some of the swamp work that we were doing too. He's, um, he's very, very, he's extremely observant. And he is also when other people might just give up and just kind of mm -hmm. with something Jack sticks with it. But the stone road, I think a lot of that, what we learned about it really started with Jack very carefully uncovering it. Cause that was a, took a long time. I couldn't imagine. And, and we watched the development of that happen, you know, from your finding it with a probe draining down the swamp and then beginning to clean it off. And then all of a sudden here's all these rock, you know, all this rock. And we're thinking, wow, that had to have been, you know, how long did that take? And it had to be just painted with the buckets and putting it in the bucket. And yeah, Miriam, the Miriam oh, and, goodness. and Aaron, uh, everybody work and Rick, everybody kind of pitching in. Right. But yeah, th there's, there's, I think there's more of a story to, to the stone road, the cobble path, the eye, all that. And Steve is as um, aware of that as anybody, because he kind of puts it all together yeah. from a data perspective. I just hope uh, we get a chance to continue on with that. That's really where my passion lies is, is in that environment. Yep. And that's, that's where I was going to ask you next was the same question that we asked of Steven. Um, if you were given any resource you had, um, where would you, where would you focus your research on the Island right now? If you had all the resources and you had all the time in the world to, to focus on something, where would you look, where would you, where would you focus? And, and it doesn't have to be, you know, it might be something leading you to something else. I don't know. What What do you think? Uh, well, so, you know, I kind of echo what Steve said. I think we all do. Um, Gary, Jack, I'm not sure about Gary. I don't know if he really likes <laughs> detecting in the swamp, but um, <laughs> yeah. I, I'd yeah, love to do more work in the swamp. It's, it's a really hard place to work, but I think of it sort of like 
a it, it's a, it sounds kind of romantic, but you know, and winter comes and you get the whole uh, whole air, landscape covered with snow. Mm-hmm. And if you just looked out at that snow, you don't know what the heck's underneath all that. Right. And but when spring comes, sometimes it's not so great, but the snow goes and all this stuff appears. Mm-hmm. And it, it's 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 really interesting how when we when we did work in the swamp, we were able to see an environment that was radically different than a swamp 400 years ago. Right. And with a lot of human interaction in that environment. And so it wasn't a swamp 400 years ago or 350 years ago. So I'd love to work there. And Steve certainly would too. Some more Doug. Doug's done a ton of work in the swamp um, and Billy as well. So, but me, if I could do anything or if somebody said, Hey, where would you, there's some spots on, um, on Tom Nolan's property. (laughs) I don't know how Tom would feel about it, but um, (laughs) Fred Nolan had a lot of interest in, and I think we have not looked carefully because he put a ton of work in there. And one thing I've learned about Mr. Nolan is that he did nothing without purpose. Right. Got that because, impression from him. Yeah. Or from yeah. And, and it wasn't just fanciful. You know, this was this surveyor and he did, he put a lot of effort. And there are a few sites that we all know of that are removed from the money pit, but were extremely important to Mr. Nolan. And so I'm hoping sometime in the future, I get an opportunity to look at those a little bit more closely. And I think they're tied directly into um, the stories from the late 1700s. Um, So, so I'm not really, my job is the science. It's not the historic historian, Uh, but I've learned enough from folks that I believe there are some sites there that really deserve very careful attention and they haven't been looked at really at all. No. When you're down investigating in the swamp, does the water level? I mean, I know that the, that the moon affects the tides, right? You know, what, four times a day or whatever it is. Yeah. But does does the tides affect the water level in the swamp at all? I, I know it does in the money pit. But... No, not really. Um, we don't see that kind of up and down uh, in the money pit. It just doesn't react. There's a lag there. So okay. what we what we do see is that the um, that the water in the money pit is influenced or the water levels are influenced just by seasonal change, the amount of precipitation, uh, that kind of thing. Dry season. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, we don't see that uh, sort of daily fluctuation. No, not at all. So what do you think about the swamp? I mean, you know, um, you know, you know, we know that uh, that Fred Nolan felt that it was man-made. Fred Nolan felt that it was there was a, a ship anomaly or something like that. We had the the seismic uh, of the data that told us there was some sort of anomaly in there. I, I'm on the fence on that. If there was a era a ship that was burned and over on its side or whatever, there has been some evidence that Gary has found in there. Absolutely, uh, that burnt strap that he had that he said that he, uh, that uh, Carmen said was had been in a very intense fire. So there are little clues, but what do you think about the swamp? Was that you know was well, that just dry ground at one time, and because of the water levels rising, now it's a swamp? I mean, what do you think? Well, at some point, at some point in the past, and I think we it was shown around the eye, there were big trees, large trees. Oh yes, that big stump that was found. Yeah, I remember that. Right. And the dates on those stumps uh, that I believe are, were cut by people go back to the late 1600s, early oh, 1600s. Wow. So um, the stump, and if those if those uh, trees just died, we would have expected to see the log. Because often, you know, places will flood, trees will die, and they'll rot, and they'll topple over. But you find the the log, the, the trunk, if you will, in mm-hmm. the swamp, preserved because it's... it's uh, Right. It's reducing environment, no oxygen, but there's there was nothing there. So I really believe uh, we got good dates in those that that somebody cut down those trees. So in terms of it, I think the word it was man made is 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 a is a little bit too uh, broad brush stroke. I think I, oh there's I, it's not I think I know for sure as 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 sure as I can be that the uh, swamp is being manipulated by people and. How far back in time, like that, the what I call the, the paved, or no, I didn't call it, I think Rick called it the paved area. Uh, that's back in around 1200, 1300. The thing you got to realize is the stick was probably a maximum age, 
not a minimum age. So you might bump that up a little bit. Okay. You know, 13, 14 hundreds. Um, still pretty early. <laughs> yeah. Early. Yeah. But, you know, 1492 Columbus was, you know, on the ocean blue. And I think everybody understands that Basque uh, fishermen were mm -hmm. probably in yeah. the area before that. Or Portuguese, maybe. Portuguese, um, yeah. yeah. So the, I, and then, you know, Doug's found some stuff um, with Billy, uh, you know, and others um, in the swamp that are, is very old mm -hmm. and uh, seems to be naval uh, associated with um, ships. Uh, so I think, I think all sorts of things are going on there. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, in terms of seismic anomalies, it was really what also helped with the stone road is there was um there was a seismic anomaly sort of close to it. And, you know, when you geolocate those anomalies, you're never going to be exactly where feature is. So, so there's more work to be done. It's, it's, we did what we could in the time we had. And then of course the rains come yep. and the swamp fills up again and we just can't keep up with it. Scott, Scott does an incredible job, Scott Barlow, mm -hmm. um, keeping that and Billy keeping that swamp yeah. workable. Right. Yeah. So, so we can work within it. Uh, it, it's a crazy place to work. Yeah. Yeah. And then we know this year or last season, they weren't really allowed to get out and do much in it. They had to work from the road and reach out as far as they could. So that really limited everything. Yeah. We, we certainly run up against um, some, some challenges there. And I think yeah. everybody hopes that if there is work done in the future, or, you know, if there is work on the Island in the future, that somehow we find a way to, to get around those problems because I don't, as a science person, I don't believe the story's even half told from that environment. That's interesting. Because we just found so much within it right. that wasn't known beforehand. I think Fred, or yeah, Fred Nolan might have known some of it mm -hmm. or had a, a clue if, if you look at his work, that some of this stuff with his surveying. But in terms of the artifacts we need to figure out the who um, and the time to find those artifacts, many of which would have been wood, probably not. And metal would have quickly corroded. Right. We found some, you know, ring bolts and things like that, that are quite old. Dr. Krista Rousseau has really helped with that. Oh, for but, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What a resource. So, yep. So putting this, it's, it's, it's like putting a story together from little fragments. Um, yep. Yeah. And that's what I tell people all the time. You know, they're like, oh, they found another piece of wood. Oh, they found a piece of metal. All right. They're yeah. all clues. They lead to a storyline. They really do. And you have to have those. Yes. And, and what I'd say to people is that, um, hey, if, if there was something going on there that was secretive, you wouldn't find a lot of artifacts. Exactly. You don't do it that way. If you're trying to, if you're trying to do some stuff or if you're getting in there quickly, doing your business and getting out, you don't exactly empty your pockets on the shoreline. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and yep. so, uh, you know, the work I've been really impressed by the work that Gary does uh, and understand I came to this late. I didn't watch the show. Uh, I didn't know much about it. I've just been able to experience the work that people do firsthand. And um, it's very careful, very thorough and extremely informative. Mm -hmm. And oh, then wow. the archaeology, that's slow work. But the work uh, that Laird has done is critical because you can do all the carbon dating in the wor world, but without the artifact, mm -hmm. the carbon dating isn't going to tell you who. Exactly. So yeah. everybody's got to be involved. and um, But you've got to have access. Yeah. That, yeah. That's the, the key. Yep. And that's so neat about having some of the new equipment that's come out, the CT scanner and things like that, the XRF. Mm. Uh, that, you know, cause it, you know, we always know, oh, we're going to, we found this piece of wood. Like you found a piece of wood over by the, the road there. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, oh, we're going to get this dated. Well, we wait and we wait and we wait. And we know you're waiting and waiting and waiting because you sent it in. Now you have to mm -hmm. wait for the results to come back. That might take a month or more. Um, unfortunate, you know, it's very unfortunate, but that's the way it is. We mm -hmm. had another question from, uh, from robot asked this question here. And he said, uh, for Dr. Spooner, he said, would coal be vital, a, a vital ingredient along with clay and limestone with the making of 18th century hydraulic cement? Probably not. I mean, coal, the, the key thing with coal is that uh, there's two types of coal. There's thermal coal and metallurgical coal. Okay. And so thermal coal, you know, you, for fires, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Metallurgical coal, uh, you get a very, very hot temperature and it's rare. 
it's anthracite it's called but it's critical if you're going to smelt okay you need that metallurgical coal and so the type of coal that is at oak island is very very important to telling the story because people would never bring a uh, one type of coal unless they had that purpose in mind right and so it's interesting without, no, without knowing what they've really talked about uh, I'll, uh you know what i can say is that the 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 kind of coal we found r really got me excited about the kind of activity that might have been taking place mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. it's a purpose for it yeah yeah exactly yeah. And again, yeah, so, on. go ahead. So I, yeah, the coal, I don't think they mix it uh, with, with the uh, limestone. I mean, you know, the, you can use coal to make a thing called Coke too, mm -hmm. for blast right. furnaces to yep. make steel, uh, make steel from iron. But um, mostly I think it would be, have been used, especially if people were there for just, if it wasn't fishermen and farmers, mm -hmm. then it would be, used uh, it could be used in a forge and uh you'd need a special type of coal to get the the temperature really high right right interesting i'm um, mm -hmm. getting back to the the water in the swamp again real quick dave asked this question he said did the water in the swamp is mostly fresh water uh or you know asking that i guess and then where does the uh it reach the surface is that in the eye area where it reaches the surface yeah it's really the swamp is is a expression of groundwater table so it, most of the water in the swamp is being fed by, you know, the, the uplands. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only time it gets kind of brackish is if you have a big storm and you get a wash over. We had a big storm okay. two years ago yeah, and it washes over the beach. So it's, it's quite fresh. And it's really just an expression of the water that's, um, you know, falling on the, on the land surface. Okay. Yeah, we know Rick tasted it that one time. <laughs> yeah. It was coming out of the bucket. He re he had to put it, and we're all everybody cringed. Right yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do that a lot. The only worry, uh, the worry that you have there is that because it's anoxic, the kind of things that live in it can often be uh, detrimental to our health. So I would never recommend anybody <laughs> drinking water from an anoxic environment because. Mm -hmm. There's ducks pooping in it, and oh yeah, yeah, yep. you know all that kind of stuff. So, speaking uh, speaking of the water, the environment, then the yep. the environment in the swamp is conducive to the preservation of wood because of the mud, lack of oxygen, that sort of thing. What's the environment like in the money pit? Do you? Work? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, so, it, I think it's highly variable, and that's why we're why looking for precious metals in the water is possible. And I think in some places, too, the water is moving around a fair bit. And Terry would be able to speak to this, and he knows that. But in some places, too, it's quite stagnant. Mm. And so when you think of it, um, because, you know, you have chambers and, and workings, and in those areas where the water may have been sitting for two or 300 years, uh, interacting with the rocks, you may produce the kind of water that could interact with um, well, treasure, gold, silver, mm -hmm. and bring it into solution. So, you know, just take taking a look at the numbers you get. There have to be very unique conditions down there to yep. get the uh, the precious metals, and it's, it can't just be fresh water, like uh, uh, rainwater. Mm -hmm. uh, it just won't. If you take your gold ring and stick it in rainwater, you could probably wait a thousand years, and you're not going to get yeah. anything in it. Not a thing. And and there has to be gold. <laughs> yes, that's the key thing. If there's gold yeah. in water. Yeah. If there's gold in water, there has to be gold there. Someone. Yeah. Right. yeah. And and that's that's I'm not letting anything out of the bag. I mean, that's just yeah. That's what the that's, that's what the instruments that's what the instrument said, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what got us me excited too. I mean, like what 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 do you do? How do you explain it? Right. Uh, yeah. And yeah. uh, the only possible explanation is it's reading gold. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, well, there's gold there. I know that. And <laughs> yeah. I, you know, four years ago, I would have said, I don't know what the hell's there, a bunch of wood. Right. But I can say without a, any hesitation, there's gold down there. And it's See, not a little bit of gold. It's not right. a little bit of gold. It's a fair bit of gold. I, w I don't know if it's a Billy Gerhardt truckload of gold, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, it's a fair it's bit of gold. It's just trying to understand and try, you know, where it is right so where can the water help us identify where it is 
Yep. And what form it's in. Yep. Those are the challenges. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, we're 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 always always uh, you know looking at the at what happens when you put a can or a, a drill down into the money pit and looking for any of this kind of stuff. You know, they think it's got to be down there somewhere. We hear Doug say all the time, Ray Charles says, you know, it's down there. We just haven't found it yet. Um, mm -hmm. And that and that and that each week we watch you know put another can down or drilling or whatever, and it's like, and we could have just missed it. And and you can't spend. You know, the big dig is great. And everybody says, well, what happened to the big dig? I thought they were going to do the big dig. Well, they need to have a target, a center target first before they can do a big dig or they might miss it with the big dig. And now you've exhausted millions and millions of dollars. And not only that, you I mean, the, the, the biggest challenge is when you do that kind of work, even the, putting the cans down, it makes interpreting the data you get from geophysics or water more difficult every time. Every time it's more difficult. Because you're you're adding further complexity to the environment down there, yep. and and the owners know this very well. You know these are extremely smart people, yep. And so you, we have to. It's kind of like a high stakes you know keno game. At some point, if you know every time you do more work, you're making it more complicated. Yep. So you've got to be sure you get answers out of the work that you do. Yeah, oh, for sure. Oh and yeah. It's it's yep. that. And that's why I've called it the most fascinating contaminated site project <laughs> I've been on. Yep. It, it just it's got a unique contaminant, um, different than I'm that I'm used to. Right. Um, so, well, so the, the swamp. The, sorry, the, the swamp itself. Then they're they're constantly trying to drain that. There's got to be like a brook or a stream for a water source in addition to ground seepage, or because I mean they're all, it's always constantly filling if they're not emptying it. Right. It's it's seeping through the uh, the barrier beach. So okay. it seeps through that quite slowly. Mm. And um, and so, you, you know, there's certainly when tide rises, it kind of keeps the water in the swamp. But I didn't see any evidence of penetration of salt water into that environment because okay. there's kind of a net seaward gradient, mm -hmm. uh, pressure gradient there. I have no doubt in the past, you, you see a lot of those beaches, there's a there's a uh, an inlet outlet, a tidal inlet and outlet, yep. those kinds. Mm -hmm. and. That probably existed in, in times past in that environment. Um, might have been manipulated by people. There's a story that uh, Mr. Nolan, I think it was Nolan, Mr. Nolan, might have been, uh, or it might have been, um, it might have been Mr. Blankenship, I don't know, recognized a wooden structure in that beach and um, underneath the beach. And we've been looking for that. Uh, we had some real, real, uh, tantalizing clues that it might be there uh, two years ago mm -hmm. uh, but we got shut down end of the season bad storms it was just oh, nasty. I yeah. I got one day i was i was hypothermic out there it was it was, oh. it was just nasty so i'm hoping too that we get a chance to look more carefully in that environment mm -hmm. as yeah. well Here's a good question. Um, yeah. Also, from one of our is is there a different chemical makeup between gold coins and random gold items? That's a great question, and it's it's uh, whoever sent that. I'll say that's exactly what we've been looking at and trying to last year trying to sort out. Mm -hmm. And so we were: is there some metal that's found in let's say gold coins? Because gold coins there's 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 different types of gold. Some gold alloys like rose gold that has copper in it right yes <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so so is there something unique to let's say gold coins from a period um that might show up in the water that we wouldn't expect otherwise yep. and that's something that we've been you know I, I won't say more about it we've been looking at uh and is there you know something if you take even silver let's face it, we had high silver too so Mm -hmm. Is there something in silver coins, copper and zinc, for instance, that we could chase down? The problem is the more the more common the metal is, the more reactive it is. So the harder it is to sort of chase. I see. Interesting. It, you know, it's it's one of those almost chicken and egg problems. But yeah, exactly. certainly whoever asked that question, that's something. Yeah, it would, it would be kind of nice to nail it down. To, I guess the same. Yeah, well, it, 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 came, it came from a particular area because of a particular makeup or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wouldn't that be cool? And I yeah. think there, I don't know if on the show they did, did they talk about any, did, any gold that came up for, in a drill hole? 
Um, they talked about the samples that had metal that had gold on the metal. Okay, well that's great because that was that was a really big moment, mm -hmm. and I can't underscore how important that was. Yeah, uh, because I was there. I was actually running the XRF with the Kelly. Oh, that's and, right. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, and and that's and then Krista did her work, and yeah. that's that's non negotiable. That's yeah. I thought that was like that, a gold plating or gold leafing or something. Yeah. Like that. It's, yeah, it's something very odd, but its chemistry is also quite odd. And um, mm -hmm. so we're all pretty excited. It's kind of like a tiny, kind of like making a lot of you know tiny grain of rice. You know, and you're saying that a you know a thousand folks lived here. That one grain of rice tells us that. But mm -hmm. where, how that would have got there? That weird comp uh, composition of the gold, right? And the metal. And I think Doug's working very hard at following up on that and trying to understand what it might mean. Yeah. Yeah, to it just goes to show that there's so many leads being followed up behind the scenes. That, yeah, you know, things that we don't know about. You know? Right. Yeah. yeah, and and I think you see the, the fine, but it, that doesn't mean we just put it away. Exactly. Um, and right. uh, you know, we follow up, and hopefully, it leads to something else that that we can can nail down and um, and 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 lead more to that who, what, where, when, why. Yeah. But that was very important. That yeah. that small. A small find but still real yeah still quite real. really important yeah very yeah. very cool okay we're about ready to wrap up but i have to ask this question before we go and i know we were laughing so much in the pre-show but we're mm. right about at two hours but i wanted to ask you I, I try to ask this of everybody that's on the island share with us a funny story if you don't mind something that uh it might be about steve or <laughs> yeah well steve yeah. Told, steve told that one about string steve which was kind of uh, uh that funny. was funny yeah, did we? That was beforehand. Yeah, but, we talked yeah, about. Yeah, I, I, I think the funniest thing. Oh, I'll tell you a funny story. All right. Um, uh, we were once on the uh, on the island. We were being filmed. I think it was a it was um it was a war room. We were doing a war room, and um, I was going to be talking about uh, about some of the the coal that we found, mm -hmm. and uh, so you know. I think Rick drove up and he he he, uh, he looked at me and uh, said, "Yeah, I, you know, I hear you're going to be talking about the coal, which is, you know, it's not gold, it's not, you know, a lot of the more perhaps more exotic stuff that we find." Right. And I said, "Yes, yes, I'll, I'll it, it'll be a short. I'll talk to you guys briefly about it. I'll tell you what I know, what I found out, and then uh, and then Doug came up to me and said, "Hey, I hear you're talking about the coal," and I said. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna. So it'll be short. You know, what's this all about? And somebody else came up to me. I don't know, maybe even Jack, and say, "Hey, Doc Spooner, I hear you're gonna be talking." About, and the, so I went, "Oh, why is everybody getting excited about this?" So I went into the room, uh, war room, and you know, we got all set up, and I got my presentation going. And before I did it, uh, Rick kind of was talking to everybody. He goes, "Well, I just want to tell everybody." That this is probably the most important presentation we have ever had at Oak Island, and so I'm sitting there sweating, like sweating my, you know what's off, and mm -hmm. because I'm going, what's going on here? And uh, you know, he goes, and 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 I, and you know, Marty was nodding, and Doug, Doug, Doug kind of came in and said some stuff, and uh, I looked over, I think it was maybe at Scott, maybe it was at Doug, and I just went, oh, what's what's going on? And then of course, it was just a. Everybody's just pulling my leg, right? Uh, it was just a huge joke. And I was getting all nervous. I didn't know what to say, you know, all that kind of stuff, because it seemed to be much more important than it was. Right. And that's kind of a, a little bit of a inside look as to kind of the camaraderie mm -hmm. and uh, people fooling around with each other, right. kind of making things a little bit light, uh, which uh, I'll never forget that. And I think the other people couldn't believe, I guess, just the way I look, because... <laughs> I didn't know what to say, you know. So yeah, that was one of the ones. But uh, I'd say every day, again, you know, I'm not, I'm not a young guy. Uh, I've seen a lot. I've done a lot. I had a lot of great students and and colleagues here at work. But when you're down there with the group of people, it's a really, really uh, supportive environment. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean people don't get testy right. and cross. And they want answers, and there's responsibility. I mean, 
it's too much going on. You gotta, you gotta produce what you, what you're asked to, Mm -hmm. but it's a very, very supportive, uh, overall supportive environment. Everybody's kind of got the same goal. Right. So that's made it really easy to continue to be involved. Yeah. That's great. I'm, I'm very proud of being asked to continue to contribute. Yeah, I think you should be. I think it's a great thing. And like I said before, I think they they did right by asking people like yourself and Steve and Laird and you know just everybody that's on the team to come aboard and bring your bring your professional, um, you know, uh, your your education with you and help us solve this problem. And yet, still, there's what what really really helps is really good leadership. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you need leadership. And also, there's really good perspective. So Craig, Rick, Marty, Alex, you know, we, you can talk about Peter and David, other folks. Yeah, incredible sort of spectrum of um, perspective. Like yeah. everybody's coming out of Alex is amazing. Like Alex will call me. Every, he said, "How do you know that?" And he's, <laughs> you know, he's Alex, super bright guy, right? And um, yep. so that the leadership. And I really work uh, very, very, I really work for Scott. Like Scott every day helps me understand what my job is yep. um, coming into it. So I really respect that environment. It makes it very easy to work there. Right. And uh, that's. That's awesome. All right. Yeah. One last question before we go. Sure. What's, what's with the spoon dog? <laughs> I, a student came up to me and said that. I said, I don't know. Was that Jack? Did Jack say that? Yeah, Jack, you were walking yeah. up to the wash table and he said something like, Spoon Dog. Yeah, something hey, like Spoon that. Dog. Well, that's just Jack. <laughs> Jack is great. Jack is Jack is completely original and a very, very kind of caring person. Mm-hmm. Right? You get that impression I do watching the show. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And and so and that's just hey, I, I think I said maybe they didn't say I said it's Dr. Spoon Dog to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, no, oh, that's no, awesome. Yeah, no, made some good friends. I'm really, really, really yeah. happy about that. Yeah. Well, tell tell him, tell Jack next time you see him, tell him we'd love to have him on the show. We've we've reached out. We know that the guys are uh, many of them don't uh, get involved in stuff like this, and that's very understandable. You know, mm-hmm. we we the, the 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 welcome mat is always out for anybody that's on the island, of course, to come on and and do just what you have done today. Help mm-hmm. us to get a better perspective of what's happening, get more detail about some of the data that we don't know. And like you said, the ongoing research to things that we saw briefly on the show, but yet now you guys are still working on it. You're still looking into that. You know, the answer may not have come yet and it may mm-hmm. at some point. Now, if you find out that it's just a brass knob and that's not a big deal. Okay. We understand that. There's a lot it's not of just- it- it's yeah. not just a brass knob, I'll tell you that. I can say that much. <laughs> no. That's very interesting. You see, and that's but that's yeah. the beauty of it is that yeah. you know, that research continues in those things. Sure. And we may find out more later down the road. Man, this has been an awesome two hours. I I can't thank you enough uh, for no, coming happy, on. This has really been great. Happy, happy to be involved. And what I'd like to say is I I, I really have appreciated too the feedback that I get. I don't do social media, but uh People send emails and with great ideas. And when people are that engaged in something as a science educator, mm-hmm. it's, it's a great thing because it um, these days uh, in this world, it's often hard to science is often hard to, to talk about. Yeah. And um, yep. and so I'm sort of grateful for the opportunity to, to apply my trade in an environment that I, I didn't think I'd be able to. Yeah, this is really cool. Well, you're you a great job at it. Yeah, you, you are. You were very good at it. And you've dragged us along uh, into the story. And, and that's something that we can't thank you enough for, because we get to see the island and the things that are happening through your eyes and what you share on the show and now coming on and sharing it with us here. And it's just phenomenal. Thank you so very, very much for, for coming on today and helping us out. And hopefully the welcome mat is out. Hopefully someday uh, when you we have some more stuff for a hopefully a season 10 that you can come back again and, and uh, do this again with us sometime. No, I enjoy that. That, that, that. Thanks. All right. I appreciate thank it you. very much, Tom. Thanks very much for co-hosting today. And Ian, Ian, thank you for being with us. 
Uh, and folks, thank you for joining us here today. This has been an awesome couple of hours with Ian Spooner and, of course, Stephen, or Steve. I keep saying Stephen. We, I asked what? him one time, what do you prefer? And he just said Steve. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I call him Dr. Guptal myself. Dr. Guptal. Well, you know, like I said, he's a professional in his own right. He truly he, is. Oh, yeah. And he's an he's a, he's a educator. He's a teacher. He's done a lot. Yeah. Yep. yep. That's awesome. Well, thank yep. you guys for coming in again off there. Uh, those of you who are on, on the YouTube side, please give us a thumbs up if you like the content of our show today. We really appreciate it. It helps us out a lot. And click on that subscribe button so that you know when we have, uh, you know, we need subscribers and also the notification bell so you know about new stuff coming on in the future. Again, thank you so much, Ian. Thank you, Tom, for co-hosting. And thanks, everybody, for being here. We'll see you for the season finale on Wednesday night. The show is on Tuesday night. Can't wait for it. And then I will be right back here on 7.30 on Wednesday night to talk about the season finale. Have a great rest of your weekend, folks. We'll see you next time right here on the Curse of Oak Island and beyond the live stream. Bye-bye.